In Faisal Biggs, I am a knowledge transfer manager in the KTN and my areas of defence and security. And I'll be your compare through uh, this morning and this afternoon's um, sessions. Um, what I'd like to um, show you, if you haven't used um, this type of webinar before, you will see a number of options in front of you. So there is a Q&A box and we'd be asking you to put any questions you have regarding any of the information that you hear today into that one. And we will answer as many of those as we go along through this morning and this afternoon sessions. There is also, as many of you have found already, a chat box. So please feel free to put in any comments. Um, into that chat box just to let us know that you're still awake and still listening but any question and answers please put into the question and answer box. Um, we are as it says on the first slide recording this webinar and we will make it available um, through um, public um, access on the KTN website. Oh. So um, I thought it would be useful first of all just to set a bit of a policy context to understand where these particular calls have actually come from um, for you and a little bit of understanding. Hopefully you would have all had the links and be able to look at the calls and the information that we sent out to you all prior to this event um, and had a good look at those. So let me just put on the first uh, presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Charles Williams and I work in the unit in DG Home responsible for the security research programme of Horizon 2020. In this presentation, I will inform you about the overall policy context in which security research takes place. The aim is to help you better to develop project proposals that... Let me start by stating that security research is one of the building blocks that contribute to the achievement of the security union, meaning to make Europe a safer and more secure place in which to live. In this context, the 2015 European agenda being prepared for disasters, fighting against crime and terrorism, improving border security, and enhancing digital security. These challenges do not recognize borders. It is therefore only through an EU-wide approach that we can find appropriate solutions. And it is only through security research that we can develop the knowledge and tools which can meet those security challenges. For research to be effective, it cannot be an isolated activity. Research is not a standalone activity. In practice, this means that security research must be seamlessly integrated into a wider capability development process, which allows a good interaction of all relevant stakeholders, end users, policymakers, and DU agencies, industry, and of course, researchers. All of these play an important role in the different stages of developing the capabilities required to perform different security functions. I draw your attention to the Commission's 17th Security Union Progress Report. This report made the point that security research is crucial for developing capabilities for addressing security challenges. In the slide now on the screen, you see how research contributes to all moments of the process, analysis of needs, assessment of what is available, and finally, research and acquisition. But note that research is not the driver of the process itself. A capability development process means that research Proposals need to respond to the concrete requirements of practitioners on the ground. 
As regards practitioners, you need to be aware that the Commission believes the involvement of practitioners is fundamental. In line with now well-established practice, most topics require a minimum number of practitioner entities to be part of a project consortium. My colleagues in the presentations relating to the different parts of the work programme will provide more details on the different drivers on the single topics under the calls. For my part, I would like to end my presentation by asking you to think about a question. What will be the impact of your project? And if I break down that question, what is the impact on the ultimate objectives? And that depends on the area and topic in question. How will the results and outcomes of your project lead to that impact? That's a question of being able to articulate in your proposal a plausible impact pathway. And finally, how can you ensure deployment and market uptake, whichever is most relevant, perhaps both in the case of your proposal? And this last element is indeed our biggest challenge in the Secure Societies program. And on that, I would leave you and like to thank you very much for having listened and looked at this presentation. And I wish you a fruitful information days. Thank you. So thank you very much there from for all that presentation from Charles Williams, who's the Director General at Home um, within the EU Commission. Um, he mentioned the 17th Union Progress Report. If you haven't actually looked at that one yet, um, it's probably worth having a look and making yourself familiar with that. And Charles talked about thinking about impact and your outcomes um, to ensure deployment and market update, uptake. I want to now pass on to Zael Johnson. Welcome her to the webinar. Zale works for Innovate UK and she is our national contact point for Secure Societies and she's going to talk to us today about UK participation in Horizon 2020. So Zale, over to you. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. As Hazel said, my name is Dale Johnston and I am the UK's national contact point, the NCP for Horizon 2020 Secure Societies. I took the role um, on the 6th of January this year, so I haven't actually been doing it for too long. But um, yeah, I'm, that's, that's me at the moment. I'm part of a, a bigger team uh, working from Innovate UK. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for joining this webinar today and I'm hoping that the inf information that you receive will be of value to you. First and foremost, I would like to provide you with clarification around the UK's participation in the Horizon 2020 Secure Societies Programme. Following the general election last year, the Parliament ratified the withdrawal agreement and the UK left the EU at 11pm on the 31st of January 2020. The UK then entered the transition period, which will run from the 1st of February to the 31st of December of this year. During the transition period, the UK will remain to be subject to EU law and be part of the EU customs union and single market unless otherwise stated in the withdrawal agreement. With respect to the Horizon 2020 programme, during the transition period, the UK will be treated as if it were a member state. This is great news, as this means that UK will continue to be fully eligible to participate in Horizon 2020 and receive funding in the current Secure Societies programme until its closure. 
Moreover, during the transition period, all security arrangements within the UK remain unchanged. In other words, in relation to projects under the Secure Societies Work Programme 2018-2020 that include the sharing and exchange of classified or sensitive information, UK participation will remain as before, with no risk to project or project partners. The reason I'm saying this is because I have been asked on many occasions the risk to having a UK entity within a consortium. So therefore, I would like to emphasise there is no risk. So this means for us, UK entities, business as usual. Now, I know there will be some questions around the next funding programme, Horizon Europe, which will run from 2021 to 2027, and how the UK may, may participate in that. However, all I can say at the moment is we don't know. Negotiations are taking place around that subject and hopefully we will know around autumn, although it has been said that we may know um, in the summer. However, due to the situation, I think that may be delayed. Furthermore, as of a couple of weeks ago, the Commission and the Member States were still in consultation around Horizon Europe. And we're still waiting to hear on the outcomes of those talks. Once again, I think the deadline for these talks will be delayed. Uh, and this will probably have an impact on the start date of Horizon Europe, which is supposed to start on the 1st of January 2021. Now, if we can get back to the, pr to the present set of calls under the Secure Societies, I've put together a summary of the calls, which includes the type of calls they are, the budget available for each of the calls, whether that be under the topic or the project itself, how many, and how many, I've worked out how many projects will be funded under each of the topics. So overall, there's 257 billion euro available. There are seven overarching topics. And then if you look in the right hand side, the number of uh, projects that will be funded are around 49. Now, the reason the reason I've put that into context is that for those applying for um, funding, if you if you go to the particular one that you're interested in, then, for example, under DRS01, the number of projects that will be funded is one therefore there will be there will be a great amount of emphasis on how you put your proposal together and how good your pro proposal should be further down under digital security there's some question marks against how many proposals there will be this is because there is a range of um, funding between two and five or two and six and three and five so from this slide, you can actually see a, how many projects will be funded within the area that you're interested in. Now, for those that are not aware of or don't know the type of action, there are four different types of action. There's IA, CSA, RIA, and there's a PCP. IA is an innovation action, which means it's the production of plans and arrangements or designs for new, altered or improved products, processes or services. The Research and Innovation Action, the RIA, is establishing new knowledge or exploring the feasibility of something new. The CSA Coordination and Support Action is the standardisation, dissemination, awareness, raising, taking into consideration dialogue, networking coordination and mutual learning and the pcp which is the pre-commercial procurement action which um, there's only one of those under general matters um, the commission invites practitioners involved in projects funded under subtopic one within there and the pcp is requirements resulting from those pro that project 
This is a co-financed action which covers the cost of groups of procures to buy the research, carry out development and validation of the innovative solutions, and to carry out coordination and networking to prepare, manage and follow up on such procurements. Now that is a, a one page overview of the calls which um, opened on the 12th of March and will close on the 27th of August. However, I'm, I am thinking that there could be a delay on the uh, closure of the calls due to the coronavirus, but we'll, we'll let you know about that. So all that's left for me to say is good luck and thank you for listening. And if you need any assistance from me as the NCP, there's my email address for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zael, um, for that informative presentation. Um, we're now going to move on to questions and answers. So please keep those coming in the Q&A box. This is your chance to ask any question you like at this moment in time from our national contact point. And, and I just want to slip a quick question in first, Zael, if I may. Um, when you read through the calls, and I sometimes find it and certainly get lots of, you know, questions come through to me either via email or telephone um, regarding, you know, the wording and clarification on the wording. So if those that are listening don't necessarily understand what's meant by the wording in a particular call, how can they seek or gain that clarification? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Hazel, for that question. Yeah. Already I'm being asked about um, some of the wording around some of the calls. Um, I have to agree, it can, there is certain circumstances where the wording around calls are open to interpretation. What I would, if there are any questions with regards to uh, the wording and clarification around what the call means, please send me an email and I will directly um, communicate with the Commission on that to get clarification for you. And, and how long would that generally take, Zale? <laughs> okay, good question. Um, depending on how busy they are, um, it can take one to two days. However, just recently I did put a question into them and, I, and that was last week and I haven't got a response yet. And this is obviously due to um, the Commission working from home and perhaps not being able to have the IT to, to be able to reply to me. And this is one of the reasons why I'm thinking that there may be de a delay or an extension on the, um, the closing date. All I'm asking is at this moment in time, if you have any questions regarding clarification around the wording, I will send that information, I'll send that question in, and I will keep you up to date to whether or not I have a reply. You just have to be a little bit patient. Brilliant, thank you very much. So the first presentation that we heard from today was Charles Williams, who's the Director General of Home in the um, EU Commission. Um, can, can any of our, our listeners or anybody actually speak directly to Commission officers about their proposal ideas? No, it's, it's usually best to come through me. And as I say, my, my email address is there. Please, please come through your um, national contact point. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So um, my colleague, Viola Hay, who is our Knowledge Transfer Manager for European Programmes, is actually monitoring the questions that are coming through. So Viola, do we have some questions come through? Yes, indeed. We had a few questions coming through. Um, one question was, will there be a new program related to virus protection? Obviously very topical at the moment. Uh, and, well, a new program or projects. There are some projects already um, being announced on the portal. But I, there, as far as I know, there's no actual program of work with, with regards to coronavirus. Thanks, Ayo. 
Another question was uh, regarding Sue Infra has restriction on transport modes for the 2020 call, as some have been covered previously, but looks on multi multi mode transport. Sorry, let's read it again. Sue Infra has restriction on transport modes for the 2020 call, as some have been covered previously, but it looks for multi-mode. What can we take from this? Any comments on that, Zayo? What, what you have to do is um, look at the past projects and uh, look at the outcome of those past projects um, and familiarize yourself with what has been undertaken previous and build upon that. And also to, to make yourself aware of any commission policies around the call. Um, when it comes to um, evaluating a project, they very much like to see that you've done your research and you're very much informed of what's gone on previous. And also if you're actually addressing the policies from the commission. Zayl, just on that point, how do you find out what's been funded previously in, in other calls or in other programmes? Yeah, you, you go to, um, you go to the, the portal and I think this is going to be covered by um, Louise in our afternoon session with regard. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thanks, I do Louise. plan on going into how you can find out previous projects and those sorts of things. Yeah, so, so really everything that you need to know the commission makes available all, all projects, project information, previous projects. Brilliant. And, and the extra voice you heard there, everyone, was Louise Mothersole, who's going to be talking to you this afternoon about the EC portal itself. Um, so just one more from me before I go back to Viola again. Is there an expected split between research and industry in a consortium for these calls? Once again, um, each of the calls has a criteria for who you should be um, involving within your consortium. Um, each one has its own specification. Um, there is under each of the, the um, areas of work, for example, if you're looking at the um, building a network of practitioners, for example, law enforcement agencies, it would be silly not to involve law enforcement agencies. So again, for those that, that want to, um, that are looking at these calls, please, please, please read the calls from back to front, forward to back. And again, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me and I'll give clarification around that. Thank you, Zell. Viola, I'm gonna go back to you now for another question. Yeah, sure. Um, there was one more question here from Arnold Gadbricks. Hello, Zael, can you please explain the CSA and IA action type? Yes, I can. The uh, coordination and support action. This is about uh, standardization of perhaps methods or tools. Um, it's about dissemination of those new ways of working, it's raising awareness of new ways of working, it's creating a dialogue um, between networks and it's about mutual learning. Uh, I'll give you, again, I'll give you the example. Um, at the moment there are two law enforcement agency um, CSAs that are on the go at the moment, ILEAD and Ilionet. Um, who are looking at um, looking at the gaps for law enforcement agencies, where those gaps could be filled. And it's about talking to law enforcement agencies, talking to those people with their feet on the ground who, who are having to investigate every single day and they know the issues and challenges that they're facing. Um, did they ask about the research and innovation action? Uh, you Preempted, yeah, it just came in. Can you, to that effect, explain the research innovation action as well? Right, it's establishing a new knowledge or exploring the feasibility of something new. That's basically uh, the research and innova innovation action. It's bringing something new to the table. Again, 
it's about looking at what's been done previous and building on that within your new project. And, and another one that came up there was innovation action. Can you explain that one as well for, for everybody that's listening? Yeah, that's about producing plans and arrangements or designs for new altered or improved projects processes or services so this is being innovative it may be something brand new that you're bringing to the table or it could be innovative in a way you're looking at something that's already there and building on something that that's already there and improving that that could be a thing or it could be a method or a process Great, thank you. Can I can I just add that all of these terminologies are on the EU portal, and I mean I'm just going over them very quickly. But there's they go in depth about what these actions are. Right. So following this, uh, Zayl, we had a few more questions coming in. Um, I'm not sure. I know that Louise is covering some of this in her presentation. Yes, yes. So I'm not sure. But it's one good point uh, Dominic Kelly is making that a big difference between CSA and IA is obviously also the funding rate. So CSA has 100% funding with 25% indirect costs. Viola, I, I do have lots of All information of on this one. If that's okay, everyone, we we'll leave yeah. those questions for later. Um, the next question was also clarifying the distinction between research innovation actions and innovation actions, as innovation actions might also need a research base. So will you cover that as well, Louise, later? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and maybe we can just say a quick word on this one. Uh, would it be correct that the cycle starts innovation action, then moves to research innovation action, and from there to CSA? No. Maybe, yeah. No, that's, that's not how it works. Alex, but it, research and innovation action is the lower technology readiness level, so that's the, the nearer research end. Innovation action gets closer to implementation, and coordination support actions are parallel to these, not at the end state. So I hope, Bill, that uh, answers your question for now. And uh, as we said, there's more to come um, on this from Louise later in the afternoon. Then we had a question, quite a specific one, which goes back to how to interpret um, the call texts. I guess we might need to take that offline, but I just read it out anyway, because it has been submitted. And just to make sure that we cover everything, could the first bullet of SU FCT 04 2020 cover the full timeline of a potential criminal terrorist plot or is the full coverage dimension dedicated to the second bullet? Okay, somebody's, somebody has already asked me that question and that's the very one that I'm waiting uh, for a reply on. Okay, fair enough. And one more for Hazel or for both of you. Um, just more comment than a question. Trust there might be time to mention port and harbor security. No, Not often mentioned, I fear. Any uh, comments on that? You want to take that, Hazel? Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, so when we're thinking about security, it's not just airports and things like that. There are other areas that need levels of security as well. So, yeah, that's a, a good point. Well made there, Dick. Um, Sale, talking about security and linking to the word security. Um, how, you know, in, in any of the potential consortia, how would they manage potential security classification issues? Okay, um, as, as previously mentioned in, in, the, um, in my uh, presentation, the security, there are four types of security classification. Um, and, you know, very often the top classification is not, is not actually within a project. In fact, it's often, it's often um, advised not to go for, for, for full um, classification you know, of the sensitivity of information. Um, there are no restrictions on how you share information within a project or um, the sensitivity um, around sharing of information. 
what I would suggest is that when you, when you build your consortium, when the consortium is built, is that you address the security, uh, um, the sharing of secure data at the very, very earliest opportunity. And often it's a good idea to have a process in place so that you can show the, um, the commission that you're actually taking that into consideration right at the very beginning. Great. Brilliant. And, and then just, just one, one more from me, really. Who, who can help if, if there are any questions about either financial or legal issues? Okay, um, I'll cover that later on. But we do have an NCP um, that covers the finance and legal issues. And therefore, if there are any questions with regards finance, legalities, you know, some of the wording with around um, participation. Um, again, please get in touch with me and I can call upon my colleague uh, Stephen Alexander to um, clarify any issues you have around that, that uh, subject areas. Fabulous. And then, and then oh, I'm going to ask another one. Sorry, I can't help myself really. It's supposed to be for everybody. So if you do have questions, please put them down into the question and answer um, area on this particular webinar. One more from me then. Are there any issues with a coordinator being from Academia Zale? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. <laughs> I don't think there's any, I can't even expand on that, no. <laughs> um, there was one more question um, coming in here from Charles. Um, will there be a discussion of networking services for consortium building, please, or pointers to places to find such? And uh, I think I might be able to answer that. Um, yes, absolutely. That's pretty much what all the afternoon session will be about. So what support services there are available, what other networks are available, uh, which can help you find collaborators and how also the NCPs can help you further in building your consortium and uh, find partners. So that will be all covered in our afternoon session. Brilliant stuff. So we, we are just, we're slightly ahead of time. So does anybody else have another question that they'd like to um, pose to Zale at this moment in time? Don't be shy now. Here's another, uh, another one coming in just now. Can UK organizations receive funding beyond 2020 if the project continues? Yeah, the project, the funding will, uh, that it has, the funding that you um, receive from these calls is for the lifetime of the project, whether that, whether or not that goes beyond, which it will go beyond the transition period. That's great, thank you. Um, that answered the question. Ah, here's another question just coming in. Yeah, please do keep them coming. Um, is there a minimum amount of stakeholders in a consortium? And is there a limitation to how many academic and industry partners there can be? Right, there is a, there is a, a minimum limit often. Um, again, once again, I urge you to, to read the, um, the work program itself that gives specif that specifies the, the minimum requirement. However, you can have as many, as many within your consortium as you wish. However, I will stress that it's, it's not the number, it's about the quality and expertise that you have within your consortium. So just because you have 30, 35 members in your consortium, you have to make a justification why you've got those members in within your consortium, your partners. And also it's about building a good consortium, not about the numbers. But please, please read the, um, the specifications around partners within a project. And we have a few more questions coming in now via the chat. Um, can UK organizations be coordinators? Yes, absolutely. There is no change to that. We can, we can still 
apply and run a uh, project. Fantastic. Um, another one, uh, are you agnostic on sources of components and strategies, etc., as international crime knows no borders? A suitable consortium may well include contributions from other countries, for example, New Zealand and US, etc. And there was a similar question here coming in through the Q&A. Can there be consortium members outside of EU? Once again, um, you have to read, I, I think there are members um, that you can have consortium members outside the EU. But again, it's, it's for specific, um, I'm not sure which um, call this is regarding. Again, please read the uh, specifications around um, partners that you are, are supposed to have in there and then when you have those partners make sure they're, they're the right partners and they're they're of the expertise that are required within the proposal great and then another question from virginia here um, potential eu partners might be afraid to engage with uk partners due to uncertainty after the transition is this the case? Um, I, I think there are a number of um, people, uh, another of um, entities across the EU who feel that there is a risk of um, having a UK entity within their consortium. However, this is unfounded. Um, even the EU Commission has, has um, sent out a, a note to say that we are still being classed as a member state. We are still um, allowed to take, um, to be partners. We're allowed to uh, run a project. There is no risk. There is no risk to any project. Um, the, un unfortunately, you know, we're trying to get that, that message out to as many people as possible, but I'm sure that our message doesn't, goes under the radar. Um, and for me, anybody who's asked that question, and um, I've been asked it many times, um, please, if you're a UK entity, refer them to me and I'll clarify that, or even refer them to the Commission. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zayl. Um, there was another more comment than question coming in uh, from Rick Chandler. Will you be telling EU partners that UK companies can apply? We have been told quite positively that UK organizations are not eligible. Um, Rick Chandler. Sorry, not eligible. Yes, Ooh. that's right. So um, no. apparently um, they have been told quite positively that UK organizations are not eligible, but that's wrong basically for Horizon 2020. I don't know where that information is being, has being has come from. Rick, can you maybe um, expand on that a bit? Uh, this can, came from Rick Chandler. Or maybe we take it, unfortunately, I mean, you do hear different stories, but unfortunately they are not founded on. There, there we've had a number of uh, questions. I had a question just recently, or comment, um, I had a, an email saying, um, I've heard that there are a list of projects that the UK are not allowed to participate in. There is no such list. Hmm. So Rick just said, when we have tried to apply on other 2020 projects, we have been told no chance. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to speak with, is it Rick? Yeah, Rick. I'm happy to speak with Rick after, after this. Um, Webinar. Can I just say also, I've got in front of me a statement on the European Commission participant portal and it states quite categorically, UK based legal entities will continue to be fully eligible to participate and receive funding in the current 2014 to 2020 EU programmes, including Horizon 2020, as if the UK were a member state until the closure of these programmes. And that's a direct reading out the quote from the Horizon 2020 portal. I can make that link available to people so they can send that to their European partners that are turning them down. Thanks, Louise. Um, yeah, I mean, I did. I have been in contact with all my colleagues across Europe, all the other NCPs. 
um, with regard to that. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Louise. I think that um, answers a couple of the questions which came in from Steve Taylor. Could you share a link of the EC's official line on UK participation, please? Um, as just discussed, we will do that. Can the Commission positively inform European partners that UK can apply to Horizon 2020? I think clearly they are, um, but unfortunately we, did, yeah, we do hear stories that coordinators are, are reluctant sometimes to take UK partners, um, so but we'll take that offline. Um, and if you have similar stories, then as Rick Chandler, please uh, would be good to to hear from uh, to hear about those. Um, as there's no official basis for <laughs> for taking that line, really. Um, so there are a few more questions from Kevin McDonald. Several calls require a minimum of three LEA legal entities. Um, is there a link to a clear definition, or oh, sorry, LEAs? Is there a link? Law enforcement agencies. Law enforcement agencies, <laughs> not legal entities. Law enforcement agencies. Is there a link to a clear definition of what is a defined, what is defined as a law enforcement agency, as this is an issue of eligibility? For example, financial regulators, public organizations involved in threat analysis, etc. Can you, so can you, comment on what's the definition of a law enforcement agency? Um, I don't know what the specific definition of a law enforcement agency is. However, I was involved with the ILEAD um, project and we had, um, I think we had about 11 law enforcement agencies, which were basically um, police forces from a number of countries. So we, you know, whether that be the Spanish National Police, the Cabineri. Um, so for me, I don't know what the, the legal definition of LEA is. I'm not even sure if there is one. Somebody might be able to help me. But for me, LEA, a law enforcement agency, is, is a law enforcement agency that has police officers. Um, and I think also, Anything that, that, that involves keeping the law, really. Great, thanks, Louise. Um, another question for CBRN cluster call. It says in 2019 and 2020, the Commission will select several RIAs aiming at research and development of novel CBRN technologies and innovations identified in the catalogue that is updated by the Encircle project on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Have the RIAs been selected and where can we find this information if they have? Once again, um, the Encircle um, have their own website and you can find all the information with regards Encircle on, on the portal too. We can maybe include a link in the follow-up emails to that as well, huh? Yeah, I mean, it really, it's, 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 Encircle are the ones that um, put out the calls and, and advise on um, what the calls should be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really familiarising yourself with what Encircle do, what they represent and uh, their policies. Great. So a number of questions coming in through the chat here again as well. Um, must the project be led by a UK or EU company and grant be paid to same? For example, a US or New Zealand project leader is the most suitable available. Um, could they lead a project? I guess the answer is no. Right. Yeah, the answer is quite clear to that. Um, this is, this is a, a European Union um, funding uh, where the, the member states um, uh, put in money, basically. So it's, yeah, so no, not, if you're outside the EU, you can't lead. And we've, ah, oh, there was another follow-up comment from Nanda around the Encircle website. Apparently it does not give info if the RAAs have been selected? I will, um, I will yeah. look into that. I'll look into that one. If, if that person who's asked that question 
please get in touch with me and I'll get clarification around there. Great. Um, and a question around IP. Um, how will our IP be protected? That is something that you um, you arrange within your project itself. By the consortium agreement? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So, and another question, uh, will necessary life test facilities be grant awarded? I don't know the, the answer to that question. Does then, do, Louise, do you know anything about that? Sorry, I was, say that again, I was busy looking up something else. <laughs> live test facilities be granted awards? Yes, anything, any legal entity at all, as long as it, it is a, a legal entity, can be granted, uh, can be given an award. And I think, just for clarity, whilst I'm speaking, as well as the EU leading, there are, of course, the associate countries who can lead projects. Is that in the security arena, though? I think countries like Norway certainly could. Yeah, it's it's one so of those it, things yeah. with, with regards to security. Within the secure, secure societies, because of the nature of the um, the actual projects themselves. Yeah, so it, I think it's not as open as other parts of the programme yeah, for things like yeah. Turkey and Israel, but yeah. I think it's probably, you know, there will be some eligibility for some of the associate countries, you know, Norway, Switzerland, perhaps. Yeah, I think it may be down to individual projects that you would have to make inquiries about that. And I think you'd probably also have to justify the value of having that non-EU participation. Yes, absolutely, because what they would say is, if you're going outside of your country, why are you, if you're going outside of Europe, why are you doing that? Is that yeah. because you don't have the expertise within Europe? Yeah, or you might want to do something that covers, I don't know, European airspace and therefore you can't really have a whole the size of Switzerland. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and this is where I come down to, because Louise is the NCP for transport and, and, um, and probably, then probably more open to, you know, this sort of thing rather than the security area. Yeah. True. But when it, the original question, any legal entity should be able to be a participant and receive grant funding. Great, uh, thank you. There was one question which actually Sean has already answered in writing, but maybe worth reading out. Um, it's about what basically counts as first responder organizations, uh, something like Red Cross. And Sean already said it's about the end users in the project and these are not always uh, law enforcement agencies it depends on the call yes so anything you would like to add to that sale in terms of the first responder organizations no no, no I, I think, think that's Sean has, has made that that clear about first responders yeah hey, I thought I'm, I'm, it's, it's Sean here I'm, I'm happy to chip in I mean it, it really is about the call in the context of the call so when you're looking at the disaster resilient societies call in particular it's going to be things like um, it could be fire and rescue services, it could be aid agencies, and those sorts of things. It's really dependent upon the call. So absolutely, absolutely. And once again, you need people who are looking at particular calls. Again, look around the the specifics of who should be involved within that call. So is that, uh, Viola, we've just got five minutes left of this Q&A mm -hmm. session, so I don't know if we've just got a couple more questions that we can take from everybody. Yes, we have. Um, there is another question. Um, what about product or project failure for technical, financial or risk that has been underestimated, for example, consequential loss, including loss of life? Um, I'm not able to answer that question at the moment, but I will... Um, I don't, what is that in relation to? What about product or project failure? Or project failure? What yes. does that, what does, could, could you clarify that please, Dick? Um, 
let's give Dick a few moments to get back to us on that. In the meantime, while um, Dick is clarifying that a little bit, um, another question came in, should an entity for another EU country join a UK consortium or apply via their own country's program? Right, um, join the UK, right. Whoever's, whoever's building a consortium, whether that be a UK ent entity or a French entity or a German entity, they will then look for um, partners to join their consortium. Um, and we'll, we'll be covering how you can um, look for partners and build a consortium this afternoon. Mm. So the whole, what, what, if somebody wants to join a consortium, they need to get themselves out there and promote themselves and say what, the, what sort of um, call they're, they're interested in, what their expertise is and how, what they would bring to the project. So I don't know about, I don't understand about applying through their own country's program. Um, I don't really understand that bit, but whoever's building a consortium, and for example, they're looking at one of the um, uh, cyber, the cyber calls, is that they will be looking for partners to join them. So you, you actually join them, another, another entity within another country would be joining the consortium. They wouldn't have to go through any other program. I think I've answered that question. I just want to say, great, that I think they, yeah, that answered the question. Um, and Dick just clarified, so live tests can be very dangerous, for example, underwater R&D, also anything airborne, for example, UA, uh, UAV, UUV, etc. Um, okay. What was the original? Can I go back to the original question? In of course, it was about uh, the potential product or project failure, uh, technical, financial, or other risk that has been underestimated and okay. leads to consequential loss, including loss of life. Okay, this is about assessing risk in a project. Um, and at the very beginning, you have to identify any potential risks and how you would mitigate those risks within a, within a project. I would suggest if the risk is so high, so high is that somebody's going to lose their life, you wouldn't even um, embark upon that. I, I'm, I'm still not sure if I've answered that question. Um, again, uh, Dick, please get in touch with me and we can have a conversation around that. But for me, it's about within your project and if you're building you're building your consortium and you, you know all your um, documentation you must obviously think about the risk within a project it's 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 part of a project so you know, I think probably what I'd say to that one is we've got James Ferryman coming on this afternoon that's talking about an evaluator's perspective so yeah. what we might do is throw that one over to him and and ask him you know if when he's doing an evaluation of a of um, a submission, if he feels that risk has been underestimated, how we would comment on that when he's doing his evaluation. So can we hold that one until later on? Yeah, Saturday? of course. Yeah, of course. Great. And looking at the time, maybe the final question um, from Roger Pullen, is it possibly possible to see a sample of a consortium agreement, please? And uh, yes, absolutely. There is a so-called DESCA template um which is a template for a standard consortium agreement and we can send a link to that in the follow-up email as well wonderful thank you very much please keep sending your questions in um, as we go through the morning session and any comments that you have on the chat box and um, we're going to move now to our case studies and i'd really like to welcome our three panel members for this session um, who are all involved in Horizon 2020 programmes. We have Sean Mallinson, who's from the Home Office, involved in iLead. We have Neil Adams from Innovasec, and we also have James Ferryman from Reading University, who's involved in Protect. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a bit more detail um, as part of their presentations, um, which are going to be, um, gentlemen, around six to eight minutes, so don't let me down on that one. And also you'll have the opportunity after their presentations to ask some questions. So again, please add them to the Q&A as we go through. So Sean, I'm gonna hand over to you first of all.
Okay, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay then. Um, my name is Sean Mallinson. I work at the Home Office in the uh, Home Office Science, and uh, my role is that of International Engagement Lead. And I've been involved in, in some Horizon 2020 uh, projects for a number of years now. We're involved in about 11, um, but iLead is one of the ones that I'm gonna touch on and, and try and put a little bit of context around it. Okay. Right, the purpose of the presentation really, it's about outlining some of the opportunities that we saw, um, the challenges and the problems that as a consortium member you will probably face and some of the merits that you get out of this. There are lots of rewards out of this, but believe me, it comes with some, uh, some challenges that you need to address within your own organizations. Um, we really started to look at this um, for a couple of, uh, of areas in that, um, we looked at the opportunities around uh, how can we get somebody else to pay for some of the work that we want to do. Um, so we looked at the calls, uh, we looked at how uh, it aligned with our uh, individual objectives for our own organization and thought that there are some real opportunities here in trying to work with people and actually getting somebody else to, to, to assist in paying for it. Um, we looked at the impact, the societal impact, um, and again, one of the, the main issues was really it was that it was what impact is this going to have and why would we do this? But also it brought us some opportunities about working collaboratively with uh, partners across Europe and, uh, and internationally. We, we can't do everything by ourselves. We don't have all of the knowledge to do everything by ourselves, which is why we were looking to collaborate with people uh, around this. OK, from a challenge perspective, why did we look at this um, and, and what were the issues? And in, in specifically in relation to the iLead project, um, this was an opportunity for us to um, look at collaborating um, with some of the people. iLead is a, it's a, a networking uh, project that, that brings together law enforcement, police officers, but it doesn't just include police, it includes people from the financial investigation side, it brings in people from the customs and the borders side, depending on the particular topic that we're looking at. But it looked at, you know, how can we actually get someone else to fund some of the work that we want to do, or at least part fund some of that. So some of the challenges that we have though, is that working as an end user, the end users, their needs are, are, are sometimes short term. Um, and what I mean by that is that if I went to a, a, a chief constable and talked to a chief constable about sorting out their problems and, and giving them a solution in five years time, that's not really what they're looking for. What they're looking for are shorter term issues. So that, that's a challenge for them to get them engaged and involved in some of the work. Um, they also have local requirements that, that, that suits their operational needs um, we needed to get over. And, and research and development for end users is not necessarily a core priority. So we have to talk to them about how we can get them more engaged and more involved in this. One of the biggest issues is about um, bringing people away. It's, a, it's about resource availability. Um, and when you're starting to bring people away from the front line to carry out research and development activities, it's really impacts upon your business as usual. So it becomes a bit of a challenge in, in persuading people. It's a good excuse. It's a good reason for them to get engaged in some of the research work. But the big, the big issues that we saw from this, the merits and the benefits that we saw coming out of this and why we really wanted to get involved is because it's having access to this wider international skills. It's looking at um, accessing uh, people across uh, the whole of the European uh, continent. We don't have the solutions for everything. And, and what it does, it actually gets us uh, some, some funding to, to support some of the work. It does not cover all of the, the costs of the, uh, of, of the project, but it does part fund some of the work that we want to do. Most of the stuff that we've been dealing with, um, and, and as you look at the 2020 program now, it's much, much further along the TRL scale than the, the old FP7 projects were. It's closer to implementation. They want people to, uh, to be working in, in this particular area. And it increases the scale. You know, you get access to uh, 
people across the whole of Europe. You know, it's it's a it's a very big area, very big population, and very big access to into business, into academia, and into the end user community, which is that increased EU audience. But one of the other things that we looked at, and one of the benefits of getting involved in this, was about starting to look at common standards and. That was a real key driver for us in that we all start to think about doing things in a similar sort of way. It doesn't harmonize absolutely everything, but it actually starts to bring us closer together in terms of interoperability. So iLead was one of those projects that we looked at and it covered all of those areas about us being able to bring people together to look at what the issues were and articulate that to industry and academia. The impact, uh, the guy from DG Home that spoke uh, originally talked about the impact and again of the 11 projects that we were involved in or we are currently involved in we really looked at that and said well how does that align to what the, the, you know, our priorities and how can we uh, deal with that so what were the pressing issues that we had that we could look at and and how could we align this into our objectives and also what difference will it make I think the the, the big benefit of the 2020 program in comparison to the FP7, as I said, it's about getting something that's more closer to implementation. It's, it's about getting things, because most of the FP7 stuff is probably sat on the shelf, it's never been used. You're seeing a big difference in terms of the 2020 stuff uh, about it actually being much, much closer to implementation. All of the partners that we are involved in, in pretty much all of the projects, they're not looking for something uh, that's going to sit on the shelf. They're looking at something that they want to see on the market. Um, so it, it's the minimum TRL is about six or seven that we're working with. But in actual fact, they're looking at at the end of the project far more closer to implementation. Um, we looked at who this affects, and and clearly a lot of the projects, you know, from the Home Office perspective, we we have that the remit for policing and law enforcement, counterterrorism, borders and security. It, this pretty much everything that's in the program covers the issues that we would be interested in. So this, um, this was one of the, again, one of the drivers, who will this affect? It'll affect everybody that we're dealing with at the moment. The one thing I will say though, is that the indirect issues need to be considered. It's, you need to consider um, some of the issues around this and it's, it's about the ethical and the social uh, aspects of bringing in new technologies. Um, from a government perspective, we need to manage that very carefully in terms of the technologies that we bring in to see that they've been through the, the, the relevant and, and, and correct scrutiny to ensure that it uh, is proportionate and we can actually put it in, in place quite safely. So what are the considerations uh, that you need to think of and, and we have to go through uh, in terms of looking at, at a practical level? How do we get the project up and running and how do we persuade people that it's a good idea to do this? you need really to get the strategic oversight you need to get the people uh, at a strategic level in your organizations to buy into this um, that becomes a bit of a challenge at times but you need to persuade them that it's it's a good idea to do this and you get that strategic buy-in through things like uh, collaborating with international partners it's about spreading the load spreading the burden of the work that, that's going on um, in terms of the benefit management um, there needs to be some benefits out of this. So you need to have some indications of what you want to see coming out of this. Zale already mentioned uh, about the risks and the issues. Um, you, you need to, as part of your submission, identify these issues quite early on. Um, and I'd be very surprised if anybody was picking up on a, a project and, and delivering a project where there was a risk to any loss of life. Um, so I think that, um, we need to manage that. So you need to be uh, really upfront in managing those risks and those issues. The implementation of the project is, is key. And this is where, in many cases, um, research projects have just sat on the shelf and haven't been taken forward through to implementation. And this is a real issue that you need to address. Um, a successful project is a one, from my perspective, is a one that we can get into the front line and get people to use. Um, that for me is the success of this. We've touched on the funding side, um, but the other um, aspect as well that's really important is about this interaction between sectors. Um, 
what we're trying to do really here is in, 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 in the ILEAD project is, is say that we're, we're identifying a whole range of problems that we have across law enforcement. And if the answers to this were in law enforcement and policing, then we would know what they were. So issues around how we manage data, um, how we detect technologies and those sorts of issues. There are potentially um, areas that are going on in other sectors that we can draw upon that we're not necessarily doing that. And the benefit of these projects is about actually bringing people together from different sectors. Okay, I only had five minutes to rattle through this, so um, I hope I've stuck to my, to my time. My contact details are there, and in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations, I'd be very happy to answer any questions for anybody. Thank you very much, Sean. We're now going to pass over to Neil Adams from InnovaSec. Hi, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Neil Adams. I work for an SME called InnovaSec Limited, and I'm going to give you an SME perspective on EU collaborative R&D projects based on our experience in Framework 7 and Horizon 2020 for security and transport. If you, uh, next slide, please. We are a cyber physical security SME uh, based in the Seven Valley in the Morven Hills. We're a micro business of just four employees, so we don't coordinate EU bids. Coordinating an EU collaborative bid is challenging and a large resource commitment. So we offer user requirements capture, systems engineering expertise, various exportation services, and security threat assessment services into EU programs. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you can move, move on one. Thank you. The first question for an SME to ask is, do you participate or not? Will it address the company's business needs? Is this something you want to do anyway? What is your role in the project? And does it fit your business strategy? How much time will your company need to commit? And who is going to do the work and will they be available? If you could uh, just click on one. If you decide to participate, how should you approach it? Firstly, the effort required to lead a bid is high. It's much easier for large companies and research organizations than SMEs. Think carefully before you decide to coordinate. The key to success in EU R&D programs is partnering. Overseas partners are key, although it sometimes makes sense for a project to have a group of partners in one country, say for a pilot. Choose your partners carefully. Chemistry is important as well as competence. Some organizations are too hard to work with. The ideal solution is to work with large companies and research organizations you already work with. You could uh, click on one. Overall, to get the most benefit from these projects, work with partners that can help you strategically outside the project for long-term benefits. Next slide, please. What advice would we give when bidding based on our experience? Firstly, attend brokerage events and don't be passive. Present ideas and capabilities and that will help you find partners. Make sure the proposed idea fits the work program topic description. For specific calls, understand and answer the question. Try to choose consortium where the coordinator is experienced in the bid process. They will guide you through the paperwork. Start early. The consortium should start to form at least six months prior to the bid deadline to give the time to work up a good proposal. Choose your partners carefully. Complementary teams are essential or reviewers will mark bids down. And finally, understand the evaluation criteria and aim for 14.5 or more out of 15 to win. Next slide, please. So what are the pluses from an SME point of view? The funding is significant, especially for high risk projects that would be hard to start and fund otherwise. It helps you get into new supply chains. The partners are potential exportation collaborators for other projects. Cash flow is positive with a significant advance at the start, which you draw down on as you deliver the project. These are long-term contracts providing income over three to four years. 
That allows R&D recruitment to work on new ideas for products and services. These projects link you with the best organisations in participating nations, with new ideas you can learn from. The international contacts give you understanding of new overseas markets and can help your regular business. Overall, it's challenging but rewarding and definitely enjoyable. Next slide, please. So what are the main negatives? Well, bid costs are high, especially as some international travelling, apart from in current circumstances, to bid meetings is often essential. Rates are not for commercial rates. Art funded, no project profit. It's very competitive, so only excellent bids are worth pursuing. We know of a security bid that scored 15 out of 15 and was not funded. The bid cycle of 12 months or sometimes longer from call to award is long, and market conditions and technical state of the art may evolve. Some fast developing technology areas are not suited to these sorts of collaborative programs. And finally, these are risky projects. Partners may not deliver. Next slide, please. So overall, is it really worth it? Our rating would be, if you could click, four out of five. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much for that one, uh, Neil. And then finally, our last panel um, presentation is from James Ferryman from Reading University and the PROTECT programme. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's James Ferryman here from University of Reading to share the screen. Hopefully you can see that. Is that all good for everybody? That's all good, James, thanks. Great, okay. So my name is Professor James Ferryman. I'm in the Department of Computer Science at University of Reading. Uh, I've been involved in European uh, projects for a well, good part of 20 years, I would say, um, pretty much continuously throughout that period, and in particular in security research. So this case study is going to be about a, a project, initially just talking about a, a little bit about a project called Protect, which I've been coordinating, um, but really the, the emphasis in the presentation is if you're thinking about going, in, going into a, a call as a, as a, particularly as a coordinator, um, a few hints and tips and to share some experience from um, from myself. So I'll talk just very initially about the Prote um, Protect project, give a little bit of context about it, the size and ambition of the project. I'll talk about the challenges um, that were inherent in going into a coordinator role, um, the benefits and risks as I see them, and hopefully a bit of best advice and um, going forward. And the first thing I want to say is don't be afraid. Um, everyone is eligible to to coordinate, uh, the UK included, um, but you have to be prepared. Um, there are, there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done uh, to be successful. So Protect is a project called Pervasive and User-Focused Biometrics Border Project. So it's a border security project. Um, it had a duration of three years. Um, it finished more or less at uh, the end of uh, August last year, but we're still finalizing uh, details on the project, the so final reporting. So. Um, so it carries on for a few months, every project carries on for a few months afterwards to do the final uh, reporting, particularly the financial reporting. And the budget of this project was 5 million euros. And this answered to a core topic, which was on uh, border crossing points. So it was particularly around exploring new, new, new modalities in biometric based border checks. And I think I would, one thing I just want to say at the beginning is that I noticed, noticed there was a question earlier about whether academics can coordinate. And the answer, of course, is yes. And it may well be the case that some topics are more um, amenable to academic coordination in my view. And this is one that I, I thought was the case and it's the reason I went for it. Um, and I, another sort of secondary point is that don't be afraid. Um, you may see other consortia being, f um, being formed and particularly being led by large companies um, or well-known companies, well-known entities, but don't let it put you off. If you have a good idea, if you think you've got a really good idea and you think you can build a consortium to answer to that to that to those ideas um, you should go for it so this is the first point so the objective of this um, project was to build an advanced contact this biometric based personal identification system that works uh, uh, robustly across different border crossing types and was also very strongly user focused um, and the project website is there project protect or the eu if you wish to wish to have a look um, one thing I just want to say, though, is that this was a 10 partner project. Of course, EU projects can can range anything from I think it's a minimum of three. 
um, to up to 20, 30, 40. I've even seen consortia around 50 or 60 partners, although to be honest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be in a position of coordinating 50 partners. I think this would be a very, very heavy administrative task. Uh, so 10 partners was a, was a very good number. And this matched round, really matched the funding, the funding being around 5 million euros. And of course, you can deviate from this a little bit, but it comes down to um, having the right set of partners make, um, performing the right amount of work uh, and relevant work to answer to the core. And for this topic, 10 partners seemed about right. And this is a mixture of the academic research, uh, as you can see, applied research, consultancies um, in, this, in this consortium, as well as industrial participation and of course end users of the practitioners. In this case, one was the Polish border guard and the second was the UK home office. And although um, project calls vary, the topics uh, vary, you'd largely expect this kind of mix um, in, in, many, uh, in many proposals and in many, in many funded projects. So what were the challenges going in as a coordinator? Well, the first thing is, if you're interested to do this, and I hope everyone is uh, in a way, um, don't go in it straight away. Be, be a participant first to, to existing projects. So I'll talk about networking a little bit later, but try to get involved in um, already uh, forming proposals, um, but be a, be a participant, be a partner in a, in a running project to gain experience with the whole EC process. There's lots of um, uh, details to go through in, in terms of how to, uh, uh, you know, to, to work throughout that whole system and to submit reports and to do the financial aspect, aspects and so on. And you gain a lot of experience from being a, a partner before attempting to be a coordinator. So I would never have foreseen being a coordinator without having participated first. The second point is to interpret the brief. Core topics can be quite vague and sometimes. You, sometimes you read the description of the core topic, it can be quite uh, voluminous, but sometimes it can be literally just a few lines. So the real question is what is really wanted? Um, and that is really sometimes a, a big question. Uh, you have to probe potential partners. You can ask your national contact point, as we've heard. Um, you can try and seek out further information, particularly from practitioners, from end users, because at the end of the day, particularly in security research, it's the, it's the practitioners who will be using um, the output of what's being generated, in, 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 largely speaking. So ask them what they really want and what, what are their needs in relation to the core topic. So this can really often get a handle on uh, what's needed. And particularly for security research and particularly for border security research, for example, you have agencies like Frontex, for example, European Border and Coast Guard Agency, who can be quite helpful um, in helping to uh, perhaps fill in some of the missing blanks sometimes that can be in calls. And I'm not saying that core topics are uh, are a vague um, by uh, well by, by accident. I think sometimes the EC makes topics sometimes vague, so they can have a, a real variety of uh, uh, proposals answering to those calls. So they really try to um, to see really what's out there and get something very innovative. They don't want to dictate too much. Um, look at the eligibility criteria. It's been mentioned earlier today. But there will be often in security calls a minimum number of practitioners or LEAs from different member states. It's often either three or five um, in current calls or in previous recent years. And this to me is a real challenge. When I look to coordinate a project, one of the first things I do is seek out the practitioners, seek out the LEAs uh, that could be answering or be the uh, beneficiaries of your research, your, your, your project. Um, and it is an eligibility criterion. Um, and if you don't have the minimum, then your proposal will not be eligible. Now, in security, there has been some quite large percentages, I would say, of proposals not being eligible. Uh, in recent years, it's been up to around 10% of proposals have been submitted which are not eligible. Um, so we're not, we're not evaluated. And I not want to, I, I don't know the exact reasons for every proposal, but I suspect that one of the key reasons is not meeting the minimum number of practitioners um, in the eligibility check. So this is very, very important. You've got to build the right consortium to answer to the brief. Now, it sounds like a really obvious point, um, but don't immediately jump in partners, um, your friends who, for example, who you think can actually work to answer your topic. Think very carefully about the right consortium because you want to have the quality partners and not too many, you've got to have the right balance consortium uh, and the right level of quality and the right input that answers exactly to the brief um, that you're setting out. 
And depending upon the consortium size, you really got to undertake management already at the proposal stage. So you really got to be um, working with an experienced, if you're, if you're a coordinator, then you want to have the experience already being a partner. Uh, if you're going into a, into a proposal, you really want to probably want to choose proposals where you know the coordinator is experienced. I think it was mentioned already in, in the previous presentation, because ensuring good management is essential, not just during the running project, but already at the proposal stage to have a chance. You've got to really be serious and professional in developing the proposal and making sure that it's as high, highest quality it can possibly be. Um, and if you're new to, new to European proposals, and understanding the overall process, so understanding the participant portal, and also really understanding what are the elements in the proposal. You've got your, your two parts in a way. You've got your sections one to three, which is your main proposal. But then you've also got your sections four to six, which cover um, the, the, the details on the consortium, the actual partner um, uh, descriptions, but also covers the ethics details and also security. And they can't be understated. You really, uh, the EC, particularly security in recent years, have paid a lot of attention to the scrutiny of the ethics and the security checks on submitted proposals. So you really can't, um, you really got to put, pay attention to what's written in every part and every section of the proposal. And the time commitment, it was mentioned previously, but proposal writing takes several months. This is not a, you know, sometimes even a year, uh, the, you know, the, the, the process starts a year in advance. Don't leave it to two weeks or four weeks, you just won't succeed. You might submit something, but it will, it will be either rejected or you have a very low score at the end. It takes time and commitment to write a proposal. And this is challenging, particularly if you're academic, like myself, because you have a lot of other commitments. I'm sure everyone is busy, but it takes several months work to really coordinate properly a proposal and get all the inputs that you need. So what are the benefits and risks? Well, for me personally, of course, the benefits, I'm sure like for everybody, is the access to a significant level of funding. You know, EC proposals can give you a, quite a large amount of money. Um, you know, as a coordinator, you could even expect up to, for example, a million euros as a coordinator, uh, potentially, or more. Um, you're, you're obviously being part of an inter, interdisciplinary EU-wide effort, uh, tackling multidimensional societal problems. So of course, national funding is important for national priorities, but really you have a very different experience when you're in an EU project. You're, you're bringing in a lot of interdisciplinary uh, um, partners, for, for example, including on, for example, like ethics and legal aspects. You really have a real interesting mix. Um, and this really adds to me, for me, um, it adds to the real experience and the, and the reward you get from uh, these proposals. Um, but there's, of course, there's a, there's a risk there in, in making sure you get the right mix. You need to get hold of those partners. Um, engaging with EU-wide pr practitioners, you know, you may well need access to those. You've got to, many proposals or many core topics expect you to demonstrate your solutions in different EU member states. So you need to have access to EU-wide pr practitioners that present their different challenges and their territories, access to specific domain expertise, and of course, access to specific sites um, where uh, your, your, the work of your project can be demonstrated, you know, technological or not, but often techno technological solutions in, in border security. So you've got to think carefully right from the outset of your proposal where you can potentially demonstrate your work and in, in, and in different member states. And of course, the real benefit is that we're maintaining the UK excellence in security research. Brexit, of course, is, being, is, is around still um, and for some time going forward. Um, UK science, of course, is excellent, um, and, and you can play your part in security research and maintaining that excellence uh, in Europe. But of course, the risks, as mentioned very briefly, is a high competition in core topics. Um, many topics only have one proposal selected for funding, so it is a big risk. You know, as an academic, for example, like myself, you know, it really hurts when I can spend many, many months on a proposal and then it doesn't get funded. Now, I can reuse some of that material in other ways, perhaps in other proposals in future, um, but it's still, you know, a headache. You know, you've got to be really committed and, and really go for winning um, because the, the, um, the, the effort required is significant. And if you don't succeed, don't be put off. Um, that's the main thing. Keep going because, um, you know, it's a numbers game to, to some extent. You won't succeed with every proposal, but it's not because your proposal was, is bad or has low quality necessarily, 
it's, the competition is just so high. And you saw in the last presentation, there have been cases where proposals have been, fund, uh, have been uh, scored at the highest score of 15, but still not actually selected for funding. Um, of course, there is a risk around Brexit. My personal experience is that I, I don't feel it's impacted too much. Um, you've just got to network and, uh, and be um, forthright in the fact that the UK are, uh, is business as usual and we can participate either as coordinators or as partners. So just finding some best advice. Um, in terms of building the consortia, attend the networking events which go around. Um, it, invests, it requires an investment of time and money, of course, but there are things like the SMIG events, uh, there's the Seren 4, which we'll hear more about this afternoon. Uh, of course, there's the, often the EC Information Days, uh, which the European Commission organise, uh, for example, on, on security research. Of course, you have our national contact point, the KTN. Use as many resources as you can to build your network. Uh, it's, very, it's very important to get into a network, um, to build your relationships, um, and, and to understand what people are looking for, and for them to understand what you can provide. Um, so when they, you know, when a proposal topic pops up and they think, oh, I need expertise, for example, on CBRNE, they know someone who they can go to um, to to obtain to obtain that. Um, so use also online partner search tools. So many of these initiatives have on their websites have ways that which you can do brokerage sessions. You can link up with people. Um, I think this will be increasingly done in the next few months and years. I'm, I'm sure. Um, do use those. Um, and also, in terms of building the consortium, doing it top down. Don't think you can go into a coordinator role and think, ah, oh, I'm going to basically bring into my consortium everybody who contacts me to say they want they're interested. That would be lovely if we could do that. But think top down in terms of what you need and in terms of expertise that meets exactly what the core needs, the topic needs, and in particular your proposal. So match the partners to what you, re you really want to do. At the end of the day, it's in no one's interest to have a partner who's doing work that doesn't fit the overall remit of your topic. Um, it doesn't, doesn't help anybody. And of course, pay attention, as I say, particular attention to the practitioners and the topic eligibility checks, uh, which often are published alongside the core topic, so you know exactly what is, it, what is needed. And in terms of building proposals, start early, don't leave it late. I say use the online collaborative tools use things like SharePoint. I found it very useful in the past to bring documents together, but there are a lot of tools like this. Use them to help to structure your topics, uh, your documents, and get inputs from partners. Hold regular telcos, um, do this every one to two weeks. It's very, very important to keep a, a momentum in, in proposal construction um, and to, for everybody to understand where everyone, everyone's at. And that's particularly uh, important in regards to bringing on board practitioners, um, which are, um, you know, like gold dust in, in my book, you know, to get, a, to, to get a good practitioner on board is, is hard work, but it's extremely important. And as I say, it's an eligibility criterion. Um, split the work and your proposal writing between people. Don't, don't try and do it all yourself. You know, you can concentrate, for example, maybe on work, working on the main proposal and bringing together um, the text from partners for that with perhaps some help as well. But on the other sections, for example, on the partner descriptions, on the ethics and security, you perhaps need your colleagues or a colleague to help you to do that. When it comes towards the point of submission, you won't be able to do everything. You really need support uh, to make sure everything can be done on time. And that's the same for the finance. If you're a coordinator and you're constructing your finance sheet, um, you, need, you need relevant input from, from support from your uh, institution and perhaps perhaps some of your colleagues to really help on that process. Again, you can't do it all yourself. And finally, perhaps sounds perhaps it sounds very obvious, but ensure good time for a proofread. Um, do consistency checks. Um, often, you know, I, I'm, I'll talk later this afternoon about being an evaluator, but often find a lot of errors which could have probably been resolved with a with a check with a, with a consistency check, a, a good proofread, and rehearse the submission. So the participant portal where proposals get submitted for the security call is a little bit idiosyncratic. Um, you've, got to th you've got to fill in some online, so as well as your main proposal, you have to fill in some other information, of course, and that includes things like some ethics questions that have to be answered. Practice that process. You can submit a first version of your proposal and you can update it with any new versions you have right up to the deadline. 
So, you know, really aim to submit a, a completed version of your proposal, perhaps one or even two days in advance at least, um, and then update after that. But there's nothing worse than having a proposal and you can't submit it because there's some other things on the system that haven't been completed. And that's in particular around uh, getting details from other partners. So it takes a lot of effort and work to, you know, to often get information from partners and ask them to go online and fill in their details, which has to be done. So it really is a lot of, there's a lot of administrative aspects, but if you manage it well and you plan for it, it's not a problem. It can be done. Okay, um, so I've probably overspent my time, but hopefully that's um, useful and interesting um, and I welcome any questions, of course. Okay, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Uh, can we can you actually hear you. Thank you very much indeed um, for that presentation. Hopefully, um, we can now take some questions and answers um, from you all. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Um, I do. I do look. Can, am I allowed to ask the first question? Would that be all right? So I'll, I'll, I'm not going to ask permission. I'm just going to do it anyway, guys. Um, so because so <laughs> I'm a little bit cheeky. Um, if you can, what is the most challenging thing? each of you have come across as being part of a consortia and how did you deal with that? I think, okay, so this is James. I think the most challenging thing is being timely in responding to all the requests. So um, you've got to, you know, it is a real commitment to time. I mean, even as a, as a partner, not, not as a coordinator, but even as a partner to a project, and you will get bombarded probably with a lot of requests for information from your coordinator um and sometimes quite with a short notice um, um and it, it's all important information that's needed but you have to be responsive you've got to be able to answer quickly to request because some of it is really needed quite urgently and particularly that's the case leading up to the deadline so i think i think being committed and being responsive is a real challenge because we're all very busy people um but you know if you're committed to a proposal you really have to dedicate the time to um, to to answer to those things Thank you. Sean, did you want to make a comment on that one, the most challenging thing you've come across? Um, yeah, I think one of the challenges that I've seen, that it, it, it's been really difficult, and, and don't underestimate this, it, it's the cultural differences across people, the way people work across Europe. You know, the, the work ethics are, are, are very different from country to country, and um, James is quite right. You know, you, you do get a lot of um, requests for information from the coordinator, and where in the UK uh, we may be quite responsive and quite quick um, in dealing with things. Um, it's not always the same in all of the countries that we work with. Um, and it's, that's a bit of a challenge. It's, it's just getting used to different cultures, working across different, you know, across the borders with different people. Thank you. And uh, Neil, anything from your perspective? you're actually involved with these projects if you find that someone is not it is not delivering technology that you need for the overall project that can be frustrating and the only way to deal with that is basically to highlight issues early and, and all the partners should be doing that obviously and try and basically engineer a situation where where you can uh, recover things where if you like the collective pressure of the consortium trying to achieve their overall goals will actually sort of make sure that things are moved ahead and if more resources are needed in a, uh, for, for a partner to deliver what they said they will deliver, then you can sort of, you, there is this, um, it, it's a collaborative endeavour, so you have to sometimes collaboratively encourage people to deliver when they're, you know, finding perhaps sort of local challenges. In, in, terms, in terms of bidding, um, if you start, if, if things start early, then that's fine. But um, what becomes frustrating is if um, there are long periods of silence because people have other things they have to do during the bidding process. And then suddenly you get spikes of requests at very, very short notice, which you have to respond to. And you just have to deal with that as part of the reality of these bids, I think. There are also various points where, if you like, certain nations go on holiday. So you need to sometimes be aware of little things like that because it can suddenly mean that there's a, 
a, a sudden hiatus in everything until suddenly everyone's back and you have to and you, you have to go quite quickly so it, I, I think I agree with the point that uh, that both 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 my colleagues have made uh, you've got to be able to rapidly respond and it's just the reality of bidding into these sorts of programs I mean just just one further question and comment actually is that you probably know I mean probably some people have noted already that the deadline for the calls is not always um, fantastic I would say I mean um, you know uh, usually the deadline for security is around the end of August um, which of course is when typically when pe many people take holidays um, so I think it's something that has to be factored into the process it's different nations of course different countries tend to take holidays for different periods and you know often and this makes it very challenging because often in July and August it can be very hard to reach people so you really have to plan ahead and really inform if you're a partner you know be available to answer those requests in July and August um, if you go on holiday it's, it can be tricky or you know I, I can't dictate what people do in their lives but certainly as a coordinator if I'm coordinating a proposal, I won't take, I won't be taking my holiday until after the deadline. So, you know, it is tricky um, and um, it, it can be quite challenging for that reason alone. Thank you. Now, um, James, I know that you had the Home Office as a partner and, and Sean, you're part of the Home Office. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, potential UK people and, and our European partners, how do they, you know, how James, did you go around engaging with the Home Office and getting them on board for your programme of work? And Sean, what's the best way to do this, you know, moving forward with these calls? Um, so this is James, yeah. So, I mean, I think you can't just jump in. I mean, you, you've got to have some um, connections already, of course. And uh, I, I've worked with the Home Office for, for, for some years and in various initiatives. So, you know, you've got to have the professional link um, with, with, with these people um, and get to know individuals within the organization. And of course, once you build up a trust and relationship, then obviously that helps uh, to establish the, the basis for new proposals going forward. Um, but I think for anybody new going into this, then there are events, there are online initiatives, and, and I'm sure, maybe Sean, I'm sure can better answer this than, than me, but I'm sure for relevant topics, um, you know, they, they would, you know, welcome to have engagement um, to see um, where there's, a, there's a, a, something, there's, a, there's a, a match up between the needs of a particular organisation and, and what perhaps a coordinator can provide. But I, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to Sean to answer that. Maybe that's easier. Okay. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that um, we've seen is that uh, there is a small cluster of, of, of police forces and agencies uh, in the UK that are interested in doing this. Um, and we've tried to promote this uh, a little bit wider. Um, what I would offer, um, and as I say, I will offer this to everybody, is that if you need end users for your particular projects, I'm more than happy to, to facilitate and brokerage where I can, um, not just people on a, a UK basis, but also people at an international level, because again, the iLead project is about networking across a whole range of different law enforcement communities. So we can, we can, um, we can help people out in that particular way in, in terms of looking for end users and practitioners for their, their proposals. Um, James is absolutely right. It, a lot of it's about relationships and building up relationships. Um, and also persistence as well um, in that, you know, sometimes we look at these questions and we look at these issues and it's, it's not always relevant and finding the right people uh, across the home office to, to look at these areas. The home office is a huge organization um, with a, a wide range of different um, interests, but somewhere along the line, we'll be able to find somebody potentially who could be interested in a particular topic, or we can direct you towards people externally or internationally who would be interested. So there's an offer there for everybody really to, um, to probably best to, to, to do it through the NCP and we'll, um, and we'll, we, we can coordinate and facilitate that way. That's brilliant, Sean. And you're, so, you're also talking about um, um, government areas of research interest. And I don't know whether everybody's aware, but if you go to the gov.uk website, you can actually look at um, areas of research interest for various different government departments. So that's probably a good starting point to see whether or not, if you are hoping to reach out through Zale or through Sean to get a contact within a various different department, does it actually align with their areas of research interest and the areas that they're interested in at the moment? Thank you. And um, Fiola, should we go to some questions? 
Absolutely. So there are some questions came in. Um, let's start at the top. What is your best advice in starting to build up a consortium? We'll also point out some of the online tools. So meaning, um, are there any particular online tools you found particularly helpful in building a consortium? So I guess it's for any of the panelists, really, um, whoever would like to take that first. Uh, well, it's James here. I, I think there's, there, there are a range of online tools. Uh, I wouldn't say there's one in particular, but to give you some examples. So even starting with the EC portal, um, where the topic description is presented, the official EC website, you'll find there is um, uh, under the core description, there is a place there where you can um, leave a request or request um, a link up with relevant partners. You, so that there's a place there you can do it. Um, but I think probably more recently, if you go onto the websites so of the various networking opportunities like Seren or um, uh, SMIG and things like this, there are often portal, there are often places on those websites where uh, you can um, do the networking. So um, you can put in your expertise and you can try and request expertise in particular areas. I, I don't want to give any impression that it's easy, um, but um, you, you take, it, make, it requires effort, but there are, there are many tools. And maybe what we can do collectively, perhaps in the panel is we can perhaps collectively think of different um, online tools and we can try and share those um, um, afterwards. Great, and some of online tools will also be mentioned uh, in the afternoon session. So yes. that might uh, give further answer to that question. Uh, Neil or Sean, do you have any, anything else to add? Any best pieces of advice you can give for somebody building a consortium? Um, if I could, um, if I could uh, start, Neil here. Um, in, in terms of the early days, um, get out early and 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 talk to people. Um, mm. It helps if you have developed contacts who are familiar with these programs, working these programs, and you have worked with before. I mean, that, that's that's the best starting point. Um, failing that go to one of the European uh, Commission organized uh, overseas brokerage events early. SMIG is probably the one that I think we find the most useful because it's early, it's in January. You get a lot of international, part, a lot of EU uh, potential partners there who are all in the early stages of forming their ideas. You can engage with them um, in person you can set up meetings online, as James has already discussed, and you get that early chance to pitch thoughts, to pitch ideas. So if you're, if you like, new to the game and you're trying to meet new partners, those sorts of events, which are organised either by the Commission or by various national contact points, I mean, UK events, but also overseas events, uh, are, are the best place to start, I, I would say. Um, Having, having made that initial contact, then just stay in touch. You will find with some developing consortia that you realize very rapidly that, that there's not a good overlap with the sort of thing between the sort of things that you can do and the sort of things that they're trying to do. Or they've already got partners who, who fit, in that, fit in that role and deliver what you can deliver. So, I mean, basically accept the fact that in the early stages, you may get involved initially with several consortia for your ideas, for, for your capabilities, and then you will naturally find, uh, you know, it's appropriate to sort of uh, drop out. You're not a good match. You, you don't fit in the developing proposal as it's, uh, uh, that, that's being formed. And one just has to accept that uh, as a reality. But basically, start early, engage, and um, see what comes out. It's really all about the chemistry, I would say. That's great. John, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, th there's a couple of things to add to that. Um, in the, and James has already highlighted this, is it's about the eligibility criteria. And it's, you really must look at that eligibility criteria right from the start. And if you don't have the right numbers of practitioners or LEA, or whatever agency is involved in it, then you need to find them. Um, it depends how you're looking at this. If you're looking at this from as a coordinator and you're starting to build something from scratch, um, again, that one of the things that you need to do is, is, is get those practitioners on board. Um, if you are uh, an SME or an academic institution that, that has an interest in developing or you have particular um, 
products or skills that you feel could be interesting uh, to, to a particular project, then use the EU events. Um, and what you'll find is from a, um, a, the, the practitioner perspective is that sometimes they look at a particular call uh, or, or, and they're approached um, uh, because, I mean, to be honest, if you look at the program, pretty much everything in the program is relevant and everything in the program is of interest. So we, we may be able to find and help um, facilitate the, the, the law enforcement side um, to get in there. Great, thank you very much. Um, questions possibly for James again. Do you feel that starting now it would be possible to submit a decent bit at the end of August? Uh, it's a good question actually. Uh, yes, I think is the answer. Um, it's not too late. Um, if you've got a good idea and you can, you can map it out well now um, to get input, yes, I think it's possible. Um, uh, I wouldn't say any later than now, but I think it's not too late. Um, I've seen proposals win that have started uh, around this time or even later. Um, so don't be put off um, um, thinking that you have to start a long time off from the deadline. Um, if you're committed and you can really put on paper now a good concept and you can bring the right partners together, uh, it can be done. I've seen it happen. Fantastic. Um, I think couple of points from Yuri, which possibly have been addressed in the comments you made before, but I read them out anyway, uh, just in case you have something um, additional to add here. So Yuri was saying that he finds it sometimes challenging to build up a proposal concept and engage with other partners. Um, do you have any feedback suggestions? Um, also, another aspect on it is SMEs and versus large organizations, academia, they have a very different way of uh, of working basically you know some it's much uh, f more agile and uh, the other is uh, much leaner and uh, so some can react very fast the other one has to go through different loops uh, in a big corporation process um, so any comments on on that well just to answer the first question i think for yuri about the uh, building up proposal concept yes it can be challenging um, I know it's going to be harder in the current climate, um, but I always found it very helpful to bring together potential partners, a, a core set of partners, the ones that, you know, not, not a lot, um, but a few core partners together in a room and brainstorm and really work out uh, the, 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 the positives and perhaps the defici deficiencies in, in a given concept and to really expand and improve upon it. And I always found those few hours um, to map out that in a room together really then followed through for the rest of the proposal. Um, in more challenging times like now, it can still be done to some extent, of course, uh, online. Um, you could have an online document where you have a proposal concept that you share, and you can ask for others to provide their input into that document. Um, but really, you have to get a collective set of heads together to really bash out an idea, a concept, and really see whether does it stand uh, firm? Um, and is it, is it innovative? Is, is it really pushing boundaries? Is it really um, going to make some headway? So is it really going to have innovation potential? Um, so it is hard, but once you've got that, once you've got past that hurdle, then usually the rest of the proposal will, will just, I would say, fall into place. There's a lot of legwork to do, but once you've done that, then of course that uh, makes life a lot easier. Uh, if I could uh, just add a, add a comment to that. Uh, in my experience, um, the good proposals, good coordinators, get people together round about now, a core group of people. I mean, physically meet for a day or two days. And that's when they sort of thrash out what's the, what are the key things we're actually trying to do and start to map out a sort of a, a work breakdown structure. So, um, you know, March, April time, that's the sort of time. In these times, obviously, this, this will probably have to happen online. It can be done, the tools are there. So, um, but I think the getting people together and getting that chemistry going, I mentioned chemistry earlier, that's, that's, that's all important. Once you've sort of met face-to-face -face or virtually face-to-face, -face, you start, um, start working together more effectively and then you naturally fit into the slots where you can have, have, have the most value. Uh, on the issue of SMEs versus large organizations, uh, uh, two points here. Uh, the first is to remember that SMEs are a risk, are a delivery risk, particularly small ones. And one has to be realistic about that. 
uh, sometimes SMEs can have challenges of various sorts, which makes it hard for them to deliver. So one has to accept the fact as an SME that you have something to prove. And the way that you prove, and the key, the key way you sort of prove your metal is, you deliver your responsive. When you're asked for information by a coordinator, you deliver it in, in the time scale. Um, you, 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 would, you in some ways have to go a bit above and beyond, but if you go above and beyond and you're, and you're helpful and you're, if you like, providing almost supplementary information to the proposal that perhaps you haven't been formally been asked but you think would be helpful, then you slot in very naturally uh, and, and the chemistry works well. So I, I think in bidding there is an onus on SMEs to sort of deliver above and beyond at the bid stage and, and, and obviously at project stage as well. But in the bidding process, you've really got to be responsive as an SME and that way people have confidence that you're going to deliver all the way through and that then you start working naturally together. That's a great point. Thank you, Neil. And, um, and we're Hazel, gonna... can, yeah. sorry, can I just make one, one really important point here about um before you, you you close for lunch go on then really important point it, it's about these early stage discussions about how, what the consortium or what the proposal is going to do and propose that you really need to get a couple of at least a couple of end users on board at that early stage because i've had so many proposals that have come my way that have ended up we've just said no, actually this is not going to work it's never going to work in an operational environment um so you really do need to get people on board who are going to be using the end products of what you are developing. Um, because if you don't, we thought we run the risk of lots of consortia developing um, proposals and, and, and getting quite a way down the development of a project, uh, a proposal, and finding out that in actual fact, it's not going to work in an operation environment. Thank you very much, Sean. So that, thank you to Sean, thank you, Neil, thank you, James, for that particular um, session and to all of our speakers this morning for their input. Please keep adding your questions. So if we haven't got round to the, answering them by the panel, then we can try and answer them later. If not, we'll answer them online. Um, so we are back again this afternoon with everybody at 12.30. You're going to use the same link that you used this morning to sign back in this afternoon. And this afternoon we'll be looking at where you can actually find partners, you know, what support you can get, hints and tips and, you know, from evaluators perspective, what are you looking to see? So have a good stretch over your half hour break and we will see you back here to ready to start at 12.30. Thank you very much. Out, um, help you can get support, you can get hints and tips and so on and so forth that will be of use to you all. Remember um, to add your questions as we go along through the Q&A box and also any comments that you have in the chat box. I don't know whether you've noticed at the bottom of the slide but we do have a Twitter um, handle which is at KTN UK so if you are inclined to tweet then please talk about what's going on here by the Twitter feed as well. So our first um, presenter this afternoon is Viola Hay, who's been hosting our questions for us, who's going to talk about KTN and Enterprise Europe Network support for you. So over to you, Viola. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just bring the slides up here. My name is Viola Hay and I'm one of the European Programs Managers here at KTN. Um, just to see whether we can make it a little bit more interactive at the moment. So my presentation is about the Europe Enterprise Network and the Knowledge Transfer Network. And to explain a bit how both of these organizations can support you and provide help to you uh, in your preparation for Horizon 2020 projects and consortium building. So if you, anyone who has got uh, already experience of uh, working with Ian and KDN, can you just raise your virtual hand? I just wanted to see how many, excellent, a few people did it already. It's growing, excellent. So a few people are already familiar with, uh, with these networks. That's fantastic. So let's start with the 
Europe, with the Enterprise Europe Network, or also called EEN. That's all about helping ambitious SMEs to innovate and grow internationally. So the Enterprise Europe Network is really a key instrument in the EU strategy to boost growth, economic growth and jobs across Europe. Um, it's been around for a while, so it has been has launched in February 2008 by the Commission's DG Grow, and that's what's previously known as Enterprise and Industry, ENTR. It's co-financed under the EU's COSME and Horizon 2020 pro funding programs, and the mission is really to encourage and stimulate the, and grow the competitiveness of in, and innovation of European SMEs. The total funding for the EN is about 180 million. And in a way, the title Enterprise Europe Network is slightly misleading because it's not limited to Europe. As you can see, it's a worldwide network, which is present in over 60 countries. It connects about 3,000 local experts in 600 plus locations. So it's really a very far reaching network of expertise, which you have at your fingertips here. It combines international business expertise with local knowledge. So the agencies and organizations delivering the Enterprise Europe services, or the EN services, they are all based regionally. So there are different organizations in each of the countries providing the EN support. So they are very well linked into the local ecosystem and connected to local and regional SMEs but obviously they are also international, so they provide these links to both. They offer a broad range of services uh, for growth-oriented SMEs, be that around international partnerships, advisory support, or innovation support. And you can see here in the three columns uh, what type of uh, services and uh, activities they provide under each of those pillars. So there is a partnership database, which I will look at now in more detail. Um, they also organize brokerage events, uh, which helps you to build your consortium. And they also organize international company missions. In terms of business support and advisory support, they can provide, they can talk you through and work with you on your business strategy, give insight into rules, regulations and standards, and also answer questions around IP, uh, any questions around IP you may have. In terms of innovation support, it's obviously helping with accessing European funding, but also can provide support in accessing national funding and also some private funding. So, and I'll provide a link to this uh, in my follow-up email so that you have a direct link to um, this partner search database. It's really a very useful tool uh, for anyone trying to build consortia and still finding additional partners. The way it works, the database is basically uh, divided into three different types of partners you can find. One are commercial partners. That's companies looking for manufacturing, distribution, franchising, transport and logistics, or for suppliers. They're technology partners which covers partners which would know about licensing agreements, technology cooperation, joint ventures, or partners who can provide any technical assistance. And there are also R&D partners, so research and development partners. So if you're looking for research and development agreements or partners for funding proposals, you can uh, look there. And here's a nice visual um, how the partner search uh, works in the background. So you need to define your need. Either you are looking for a partner, then you can search the profiles and express an interest against any organization and partner you would like to uh, contact and uh, you would like to draw collaboration with in more detail. Or if you are wanting to provide um, capability and create your own profile, you can do that as well and just define in your profile what you're looking for exactly and what you can offer. And then the database helps you to find the right partners, hopefully at the end. So, and then just to finish um, on the EN, 
in addition to international partnerships and uh, in addition to this uh, the database, they also provide matchmaking events and they're running company missions, the so-called GBIPs, which are Global Business Innovation Program missions. And those missions are then complemented by the missions KDN is leading, the Knowledge Transfer Network is leading, um, which are called GEMS, Global Expert Missions. They both have slightly different focus, but um, are very complementary to each other. So, and moving on to the Knowledge Transfer Network. So we are a not-for-profit SME and basically Innovates UK's networking partner. So most of you will be familiar with Innovate UK, I believe. Um, Innovate UK is the UK's innovation funding agency and most of our grant comes from Innovate, but we work very closely across UKRI and also with uh, a lot of other government departments like the Department for Transport or Department for Health and so on. So we are, all, we are all about innovation, helping companies to bring new products, processes and services to market faster, strengthen the UK economy and improve people's lives. We cover all sectors from agri-food to autonomous systems, from energy to creative and design. And we have sector experts like my colleague Hazel here uh, for the security and defense area. We have sector experts in all of those different sectors, about 120 of us, and overall KTN has about 190 uh, members of staff at the moment. And what our unique selling point is, is really that we combine this in-depth sector knowledge with the ability to link up and to connect cross-sector. So I'm just here, a little overview uh, of the KTN. So the figures are slightly out of date now, so they are higher, a bit higher now, but we have about 40,000 organizations in our network now, which is over 90,000 individuals. We broker 400 plus new collaboration each year, making nearly 6,000 uh, business to business or business to research introductions. Um, Poonam will be able to tell you how many events we run, so, but it's a lot. Uh, last year it was in about 310 plus. And we are also running something which is called special interest groups, where we focus on working closely with industry and identifying certain challenges and working on challenges which industry is facing, which would then feed into roadmaps, white papers, reports, which can then inform future funding courts, for example, or future policies in government. Again, you can see the sectors we cover and a few of, other, uh, of our other programs um, which KTN is running. So as I mentioned, we're all about connecting people and driving innovation. So we can help you find the right expertise, find the right collaborators, finding new markets or finding ex and accessing finance and funding. So be that public or private. And in terms of uh, supporting European programs and my particular role within KTN, it's all about helping UK organizations and in particular businesses to engage with Europe and with Horizon 2020. We work closely with the uh, national contact points and the, Europe, uh, and the Enterprise Europe Network to support UK companies and organizations. We are building on existing links with the Commission, with the ETPs, European Technology Platforms. We are, for example, as KTN is, um, and has been involved for years in SUSCHEM, which is one of the ETPs in the chemistry area, but also the public-private partnerships like the bio-based industries, uh, joint undertaking and SPIRE. We participate in projects also ourselves as a partner, but only obviously where it supports our own purpose and strategy. And projects we usually um, go for and participate in are the so-called coordination support actions, which is all about, uh, as Luis will go into more detail later, building networks, building clusters, bringing clusters, networking, expertise and knowledge together, looking at 
connecting value chains and supply chains. So that's basically all with the view of supporting UK businesses again, if you get involved in those kind of projects. And just to finish there, we identify opportunities for collaborations across sectors and along value chains. So, and we complement the NCPs and the EN activities by providing support in consortium building, in selected topics. So we run our own UK events around that. Um, and if not for COVID-19, this would have been a face-to-face -face event here as well, where we would have done a bit more on the consortium building aspects. Um, we also started to offer travel support to SMEs, um, and in particular, quite specifically, for-profit R&D performing SMEs here in the UK, to enable them and to encourage them to attend uh, EU brokerage events. So the bigger events organized by the Commission, where you have hundreds and sometimes even thousands of people and partners from across Europe. And they are the best events, as Neil mentioned earlier as well, to really get involved and build your network of European collaborators. Given that we have sector experts in each of the various industry sectors, as explained earlier, we can give sector specific advice because we have all this good, good understanding what business needs are and challenges are across all those sectors. We can advise you on market opportunities and impact of projects. And we can also provide some of our own experience and experience um, in being part of the Horizon 2020 project because we've been involved in quite a few by now. So we have our lessons learned and our hints and tips and do's and don'ts, uh, which we go into in a minute as well. Because yeah, we've, we've done it ourselves. So um, just to final, uh, finish here and to repeat, if we get involved as a partner in a project, it needs to be strategic and we, it's, it needs to be all about increasing our business collaboration, facilitating exploitation and increasing business-led R&D. And usually our role within projects is helping to connect partners and advancing networking opportunities across sectors and value chains, capability mapping, which we then can build on and provide uh, to UK uh, businesses and organizations, exploitation of developed IP and dissemination and communications activities using obviously our vast uh, network of contacts linking it to KTN organized events and just building the bridge between UK and UK voice and European what's going on in Europe basically to have common learning shared learning and it's this two-way transfer of expertise between EU programs and the UK strategy and making sure that UK voice is still fed into what's happening into Europe and that we still learn from what's going on in Europe. And just to end with the slide of uh, the various European projects KDN has been involved with. From FP6 to from FD7 and live projects Horizon 2020 you can see here is quite a mix. And just to finish off, I leave you with my email address and my telephone number so you can get in touch. So that's from my, is that it from my side? So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viola. Now, unfortunately, Talia is not able to join us today. She does send her apologies but we do have an annotated presentation from her. So if you do have questions either for Viola or for Talia, if you can pop them into the Q&A box um, and we'll answer those or publish the responses from Talia after her presentation. Great, so Hazel, are you playing Talia's presentation or shall I? If you could play that, that would be wonderful, thank you. No problem, I'll share my screen again. And now you'll hear from, <clears throat> from Talia from the Seren4 network, as Hazel just said. Just need to sort my presentations out here in the background, but here we are. So this presentation is about the uh, security research map, which is another tool which will be very useful for you to find potential collaborators for your Horizon 2020 Hi everyone, proposals. my name is Talia and I'm...
we've not actually got any sound at the moment viola viola i think if you mute yeah, yourself it cuts off the sound a profile platform <laughs> partner search tool and project idea database created by the seren project the seren project is a horizon 2020 funded project that gathers together all the different national contact points or ncps for secure societies. Some of the benefits of Surema are that it can help you highlight your added value, help you promote your research ideas, and ultimately help you find partners for your security related projects. You may be wondering what the difference is between Surema and the Funding and Tenders Partner Search tool. Unlike the Funding and Tenders tool, the Sarema database has a quality check done by the national contact points. It is specific and security related, so only discusses the topics in the Secure Societies Work Program. And each organization can choose their own contact person instead of it automatically being designated as the leader of the organization, as is done on the Funding and Tenders platform. Here you can see a screenshot of the homepage of the Sarema database. On the left, you'll be able to see a place for you to log in, insert your profile or the existing profile, as well as search the database for different organizations or project ideas. You'll also be able to see a list of all the different organizations listed on the database by country. To create a profile, you'll have to fill in five different categories for your profile description. The first category is about the organization, the name of the organization, where it's from, how many employees it has, and who the contact person is chosen for the organization for these specific security related topics. Next will be the field of activities. Here you'll be able to choose different areas of interest to your organization. In addition, you'll be able to describe your core competencies in your own words at the bottom. Next is the research focus. Here you'll be able to choose specific topics that your organization is interested in from the Secure Societies Work Program. For example, if you're interested in DRS2 FCT3 and BES1, you'll be able to check them all and show that these are the topics that you are interested in. Next is the section that deals with your organization's experience in research projects. Here you'll be able to list specific security projects you've participated in before or projects in other themes of Horizon 2020, FP7 or additional programs. Finally, is the project idea section. This section isn't mandatory, but can help you find potential partners for your project. You'll need to list the title of your project, a short description of it, and what role you presume to play, the partner or the coordinator. In addition, you'll have to pick the specific topic that the project relates to and list the different types of activities that it will do. After your NCP goes over your profile, you will appear in the search function. Here you can search for different types of organizations using different fields. You can search based on field of activity, research focus, experience, country, or even by using text. Here we have an example where we searched based on field of activity. I've entered cybersecurity as the field of activity I'm interested in. As you can see, we receive 184 organizations that is, have listed cybersecurity as a field of activity. In addition to the field of activity, you can also choose to list only specific project coordinators. This will narrow the search down and help you find what you're looking for. Another option to search is according to the different project ideas. To do this, press the show all button on the left hand side of the web page. The search results will show you all the different project ideas listed on the Sarema database according to the date they were entered. If you click on a specific project idea you're interested to know more about, you'll see all the different sections that we needed to fill in before. 
the name of the organization, the project title, a short project description, the role within the consortium that the partner will play, and the types of activities. As you can see, the name of the organization is clickable. Once you click on it, you'll be led to the organization page where you'll see the contact point for that organization and be able to reach them. The process of quality checking profiles starts the minute you enter in your profile. The NCP from your country then receives an email alert about a new profile from their country. They then enter the database and check the user profile. If any information is missing from your profile or the NCP feels that some sections need more information, they will reach out to you by email and ask you to fill this in. After you have completed your profile, the NCP will publish your profile and you will then appear on the Serema database as well as in the search function. Thank you for your attention. We hope to see all your profiles on the Serema database today. Thank you very much, Vitalia, for producing that um, PowerPoint for us. And as I said, if you've got any questions um, about the database that Talia can answer for you, then we'll get those answered um, after the event. If you've got any questions for any of the speakers in this session, please pop them into the question and answer space. Or indeed, if you've got any questions um, from the earlier session this morning that we haven't answered or that you've thought about over the break, please add those too. I'm now going to pass over to uh, Louise Mothersol, who's a Horizon 2020 NCP for Transport, to talk to us about the EC portal. Hi everybody, just a moment while I pull this up. So as well as this being a presentation, uh, just checking, you, you can all hear me, yes somebody? Yes. Um, thanks. As well as this being a presentation, I'm going to actually go into the participant portal live and show you um, exactly how you would interact with it and the different functions and things that, that are there. So this is what it looks like. This is commonly, commonly known as the participant portal because that's what it used to be called. Now you can see it's actually called the funding and tender opportunities or the single electronic data interchange area, SEDIA, and lots of different people call it by lots of different things. And this is basically, as it states there, the entry point for participant and experts in funding programs, not just Horizon 2020 as it happens, but a whole host of others. But if I click on this, I think I've got it as a live link and we can go and it'll open it. There we go. You're gonna get the slide deck, so you'll get these links as well. It asks if I want to accept cookies every single time. So there we go. But in here, you can see there's all of the, the, the top buttons are all of the information, how to participate, the different ways in which you can search um, projects that have been run in the past. You can search how to work as an expert. Expert in this jargon means an evaluator. And James is going to cover a little bit more about that later. And also how you can get some support. However, the first thing, if you're not familiar with this, the first thing you should do is over here, register and create yourself a login. So here is face, this is for you personally, you know, your first name, last name, email, I enter the code. So this is just for you personally to create an account. Now I have one already, so I won't bother doing that, but this is quite important because you will need to have a personal account before you can register your organization. And every organization has to be registered to get a participant identification code, a PIC. So before I go into showing you how to do all of those other things that you can do on here, we're going to see how to be create a PIC. So in this how to participate box up here, you'll see that there is a participant register. So the first thing to do is to click on there and let's have a look to see whether somebody has already registered your organization or an organization with a name very similar to yours that you might get confused with. Or um, you never know, somebody may have registered an organization with exactly the same name as you or even has registered your organization and that was a previous employee that's now left and you don't know where to go next. So first thing we're going to do is search a PIC, participation, participant identification code. 
So we'll search it and we're going to look for a registered organisation and I'm going to just search to see whether, um, I don't know, Innovate UK is on there. That's where I'm from. Uh, and no records found. You think, oh, excellent, that means Innovate UK is not on here. Well, actually, I happen to know that Technology Strategy Board, which we used to be called, is actually how, how we were registered and that's now become suspended because we've joined UKRI. So this is basically, you would go in, type in your organization there and just see whether somebody has already registered it and you've already got a pick. If you haven't already got a pick and there is nothing, we'll come back up here to look at it again. So there isn't a, uh, a pick already for your organization so now you're going to register your organization instead and this is important as I said because without a pick you can't do anything you can't submit a proposal you can't contact the European Commission you can't um, participate in the, the the partner search through this portal or any of the other aspects so when you come to register your organization you'll see the first thing it does is say sign in so I'm not going to sign in because I've already registered. I'm part of Innovate UK, so that would just confuse matters. But this is basically where you go in and you talk, you answer the questions online until you've answered sufficient to get you a pick. There are more questions that you have to fill in and the financial reports you will have to submit and things like that eventually. But those aren't required to actually submit a proposal, but they are required to actually sign a grant agreement. So after you've got your proposal writing over and done with and you've submitted it, you can always go back to the portal and complete your organization's registration. So I'll come out of that part of it and we'll go back now to say, okay, we've got a pick. What you really want to do is find a call for proposals. So we're going to search the funding and tenders and it's loading the data. I'm going to take a little bit of time between clicks to, to give it time, hopefully, for it to up to refresh at your end, because I know it, doing these things electronically, it doesn't always refresh instantly for you. But you see here, it's come up with 5,276 results. Well, we can narrow that down instantly. We don't want any that are closed, so I'm going to click on that to say, stop showing me things that are closed, not interested. It's also currently showing us lots of programmes that are not just Horizon 2020. As I said, this is used for all of programmes. So I'm now going to choose down here, select which programme, and I'm going to, of those that have got activity, I'm going to say, we're only interested in Horizon 2020 this time. Of course, if you wanted to explore what else is around on here, well worth doing. But for now, I'll just click Horizon 2020. And now we're down to only 256 open calls for proposals, open topics. You could, at this point, type in the keywords that you're interested in. Or we can narrow it down a little bit further to say, down here, there's a select by program part. Now for me, as, as I said earlier, I'm the national contact point for transport. I'm talking to you now because I've been doing national contact pointing for about five years. Um, and so I got a bit more experience of these sorts of some of these things here. So select a program part and you can scroll through all the different parts of Horizon 2020. And within the societal challenges part is one called Secure Societies protecting freedom and security of Europe and its citizens. So we'll click on that. And now we're down to the 20 open topics that are there specifically for the security program and that are the subject of today's uh, teleconference webinar. So I'll just flick back to my proposed, my presentation for a moment so we can see what else I was going to say, make sure I'm not missing anything out before we go on from there. Um, moving on, it won't let me move on for some reason, excuse me a moment, while I, and it won't let me exit it either, that's great. No exit, no moving on. I think it's presumably because I'm in the, uh, see, hang on, see, this is a, I'm trying to hit my escape button and nothing's happening. 
Let's try old control alt delete. Sorry about this. I don't know why it didn't. Let's just um, shut it down through the task mask because uh, something's going wrong with that. So we'll try again. The participant portal. Right. So we went through how to register up there yourselves and create a login for the organization. There's the login for the organization. So you'll get these slides so you can see how we got to where we went when I flicked through. And then we went to let's have a look at the searching, search funding and tenders. And we get rid of the closed ones. And we chose just Horizon 2020. And we chose just Secure Societies. And that came up with 20 results. So now I was going to go through and explain what a topic looks like. So a topic is basically an individual call for proposal. It's, it's uh, asking for a specific uh, question that you're asked to respond to. And every topic has the same basic structure. So every one always has a title and a number such as this. Uh, it has a type of action. Now we've had a little bit about that already, but I'll talk a bit more about the type of action. It says the specific challenge, the scope and the expected impact. And these are the meat of the call for proposals. This is the meat of the topic. So the specific challenge is what are they asking you? What problem are they asking you to solve? And the scope is what sort of activities are they expecting you to do? Not prescriptive um, when it comes down to the specific actions, but what, uh, you know, what is the project scope expected to cover? And then there's the impact. So what is the project expected to achieve? What difference will it make? And then there's always a section called topic conditions and documents. And it's well worth going through these thoroughly because there are very useful links to the relevant additional material. And I'll go through one of those in a moment to show you. But the types of action we discussed earlier that there are three main ones. In fact, there's also in this particular in secure societies, there is also a pre-commercial procurement uh, action, but I'm not as familiar with that. But the main ones are these research and innovation action, innovation action and coordination and support action. So there are some links here that will take you through to definitions, templates, um, additional information. So the research and innovation actions tend to be the, of the lower technology readiness level. And there's a, a link there that would take you through to where the definitions for the EU are. So what do they mean by TRL2, TRL3? And that link will take you that. So it means you know, reasonably low, but not not very mature and because it's such a lower technology readiness level it's funded at a rate of 100 percent of eligible direct costs for every participant plus an additional 25 percent on top of that for the indirect costs and that's for everybody that's involved and eligible direct costs include things like the salary of this people working on the project for the hours they are working on the project so timesheets have to be kept also pro rata from that salary cost is the employer's national insurance contribution and employer's uh, pension contribution. And that tends to be it for personnel costs. Other costs can in include things like travel and subsistence because clearly these are usually collaborative projects where you're traveling around and you're meeting your partners. So all travel expense is fully covered at 100%. Um, any uh, equipment purchase that is specifically for the project is also 100% eligibly um, a, a direct cost. If it is a large, substantial piece of equipment with a life beyond the project, you know, in my part of the world, for example, on the transport program, we have people buying electric buses. Clearly, they're going to last longer than we would hope, last longer than three years. So then there's a depreciation value comes in and only the depreciation can be claimed and any residual value not. So if research and innovation actions require at least three independent organisations from three different eligible countries. UK, as we've heard, is classed as eligible. Um, and within the call for description, call for uh, 
proposals, each of the topic will actually talk about what is eligible in and what is not eligible. So they will certainly say if there are specific countries that cannot participate, which in security is an issue at times. And then there is also a standard proposal template, which is available on the system and you can link, link to it directly from here. Innovation action is a slightly higher, and I said, I'm using the words lower and higher because these are not fixed. So it's higher technology readiness level of about five to seven ish. So seven is getting to be demonstrated in a realistic environment. Uh, for those that don't know of TRLs, the technology readiness levels, they go from one to nine, whereas one is like a, a sketch on, a, on a, or an idea and you know, it's paper based. Uh, nine is almost at the stage where you can buy it on the shelf at Tesco. So, and the whole range is in between. But because the innovation actions are higher technology readiness level, only not for profit partners are funded at the 100% rate. Anybody who is a for profit, whether you are Airbus and Rolls Royce, the, uh, IBM, the big companies, or whether you are a singleton SME, then everybody who is in it for a profit will only get 70% of their eligible direct costs, plus another 25% of that for their indirect costs. The same uh, eligibility for participation applies. So it needs to be at least three independent organizations from three different eligible countries. And it, it has to be truly independent. So we can't have, for example, Airbus uh, UK, Airbus France and Airbus Germany. They're not three different organisations. Also, people ask me whether England, Scotland and Wales count as three different countries. No, nope. UK is a country for the, for the purposes of Horizon 2020. And it's the same proposal template, actually, as for the research and innovation action, which I'll go through this afternoon in my next slot. So moving on, coordination support action. As it implies, they are, as, we, as you've heard already, they are for coordinating actions, for supporting activities. They're not about the creation of new innovations, new research programs, but they are again funded at 100% for everybody, 100 plus 25% for everybody again. Theoretically, eligibility is that you only need one single organization from one eligible country. However, most CSAs would not succeed if they were to go forward in that way because their very nature requires broad participation of the, the stakeholder community. And there's a different template for this because uh, fewer number of pages. So now this is where you would find the reference documents. So I'm going to nip back into uh, the participant portal just to show the different tabs in here. So along with how to participate, when it had here the participant register, which is how to register yourself, you'll see there's some other things, reference documents and partner search. So reference documents are incredibly useful because absolutely everything you ever need, oh I should have, yeah I've got chosen the Horizon 2020, is here. So here you will see if we were to open up each of these in turn uh, till we find the work program and here at the bottom you would find um, where we got secure societies and this is now a pdf version of the entire work program for secure societies and I, this is worth looking at because of the additional information this contains that isn't available on each of the topic websites topic pages because this will have background information. So you see here, before you even get to the first topic, which is on page 11, there's been a number of pages already giving you background information about the purpose of this work program. And this is very important that you have read this and are able to refer to it if appropriate in your proposal. You can also see that each of the calls, and I'd link onto this, you can see the conditions for the call. So conditions, lots of people, one of the most common questions I get is people will say, how long do I have to wait till I hear something? Well, that information is all published. Absolutely every piece of information to do anything around Horizon 2020 is all published. But finding it can be a bit of a tricky thing. But you'll see here, as well as saying what the deadlines are and what the overall budgets are and what the opening dates are 
and the closing dates, they will also say, so five months from the final date of submission is when you get to know about the outcome, and then you'll get a grant eight months from the final date of submission. So that's the grant agreement. And that's also useful here is that they'll give you specific eligibility conditions. So we talked about, you know, here, this one says at least two operators of the chosen type of critical infrastructure operating. So for this particular one, Infra 01 2020, because clearly 2018 and 19 have been and gone, then there are specific criteria listed that who else must be involved. Also tells you you mustn't be more than 24 months um, and industry must be able to provide security solutions in there. So this is where this additional information can be very, very useful. You notice this one here says at least two local governments of two cities or metropolitan areas in two member states or associated countries must be beneficiaries. So that's a useful thing and we can talk about associated countries as well. But this, so some of these calls will specifically mention associated countries are relevant. So nipping back to my presentation. There's some additional information and support here on all of this is available through the participant portal. Most of it, you'll see that there is the Horizon 2020 online manual. There is something called the annotated model grant agreement, which is 846 pages long, so don't print it. We have a colleague, Stephen Alexander, that's a link to his website. He, his role is to know this backwards uh, and advise you of it. Yeah, any issues that uh, you know, people like Zale, Viola and myself can't. Stephen Alexander is the oracle. There is the European Commission IPR help desk. These are fantastic. It's the best help desk I've ever come across. And they do have templates for things like teaming agreements, non-disclosure agreements. And because these are European Commission approved, they're very easy for a small business to take to a business, a big business and say, no, we don't have to bend over and use yours. We can use this EC approved one. So that's an excellent thing. To, and then there's the frequently asked questions as well, which you can filter by keyword or selecting a theme. A couple of page, uh, slides now on building a winning consortium. Every topic web page has a partner search section. So going into that, going back to the funding and tenders, Going back up here to search for funding and tenders. And just to try, we'll put in the words secure up there. And we've got some, excellent. We don't want the closed ones though. Um, and some of these are not in your part of the programme, so we'll just choose those that are. Of course, it's worth you thinking about those that are not in your programme. If there is security, um, topics happening in other parts of the work program it's worth looking at too but if we just open up one of these tum tum takes a little while come on open up so this one as we know is opening soon and what i showed you earlier about the topic anatomy is always the same we have a specific challenge what's the problem we're solving we have a scope which is what activities do we want happening in this? And then we also have towards the bottom here, we will have impact. What should, a pro what should it actually deliver? I also mentioned that there is a topic conditions and documents. Show more, we can see all of those as well. Where'd they go? Show more. Now it's got their support. With See, I've gone far too, far too quickly. I'm sorry, it's probably jumping around all over for you guys as well. So you can see all of the additional documents here, including the work program, the rules and regulations, the templates, um, the funding rates, the eval a standard evaluation form so you can self-evaluate. All of the information is available here, including when we scroll to the bottom, 42 organisations are looking for partners for this topic. And we can have a look at who those are. So it's an Excel spreadsheet and each of these you can go through and interrogate and find out a little bit more about them. Now this is an interesting one because although we, we talked earlier Zale and I about whether associated countries could participate or not, this one's from Tunisia. 
So we're assuming that they have checked that they can participate, um, but it went in there three days ago because Tunisia is an associated country. So going back to my slides, sorry, dashing all over. I realize it's a mess, but hopefully you're picking it up. So we went through and looked at that. Then when you, when you see that there's 42 in different organizations seeking partners, interrogate them. You can click on each of them and it will show you whether they've been involved in projects before, in what role. Uh, you can also create your own partner profile, of course, and upload that. And my advice would be to make it specific to the topic, not just a generic, we're really great at this sort of stuff. Reference which bit of the scope it is that you would be planning to address in that topic and demonstrate how you can help the consortium to win the work. Because at the stage of putting a proposal together, that's really what people are most interested in. Uh, we talked earlier, you heard from Viola talk about the EEN and the KTN. Um, oh, here's my, this is my old slide, you see, because there was a transport information day so with a brokerage event. We've heard that there are others specifically for security. And you can do a keyword search on the portal on, in the how to participate to find out the previous projects. But I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go into all of that right now. By far the best way to winning a t to build a winning team, I think you heard very similar from Neil and James um, earlier. It's about actively being a demonstrating that you are a good partner to have. So participating in working groups, trade bodies, conferences and events, being helpful. This volunteer to be the one that does the work, the newsletters, the technology roadmaps, workshops, um, demonstrate to your counterparts that your expertise is an essential component of a winning team. Um, for example, you may wish to get involved in the contractual public-private partnership, which is the EU cybersecurity uh, group. Now, these will be a formal group that actually support the European Commission in the construction of the work programme. So there's some strong uh, links there for you as well. I think that's all I was going to say because there's a lot you can say about this, but Zale and myself as National Contact Points, our full-time day job is to help people navigate uh, these systems in more detail. And I think Zale's going to tell you a bit more about that. But we do, I think we're going to do questions at the end. Yes, we are indeed. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for that one. Super fast whistle stop tour through the portal there, Louise. Um, but let's let's um, keep your questions coming for us about anything that you've heard from today and also any of the presentations that we're going to now. And I'm going to hand back to Zale um, to talk about the NCP support that you can get from her. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can do. Great. I'm just trying to get the slideshow up. Here we are. Great. Okay, I'm taking that you can hear me now. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those that weren't on the this morning's um, webinar, uh, my name is Zale Johnston and I'm the NCP for Secure Societies, um, NCP National Contact Point. Um, thank you, Louise, very much for that. That was that was absolutely brilliant, and um, I hope that's given everybody an idea of of some of the places that you can go to every piece of information is is on that portal however navigating through that portal is is, is pretty arduous but um if you can't find anything that you're looking for please please ask okay i'm, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the role of an ncp and what assistance um i can give or nc any ncp can give uh uh, their entities, whether it's a national contact point in France or Germany, Italy, um, what really um, their roles are to their own country's entities and people seeking 
uh, to um, bid and, and have successful projects. Now, although I am now an NCP and I've only been doing the job since January, I was prior to that uh, part of a project for over two years. Um, I did help to um, write the proposal, which we, we got 14 and a half out of 15. I was uh, the work package lead, uh, which included managing budgets, ensuring that deliverables were on time. Um, so that meant also I had to be part of a project review, which is often, um, well, well, that's what happens. You, you have a, a review during the, the life cycle of your project in which uh, the commission will come and review the work that you've done. Um, but, it, you know, I'm going to go through the, um, the core roles of a national contact point. However, outside of those core um, activities, you know, it, as a national contact point, you have to build relationships. You know, you have to you have to also liaise between the commission and entities with other NCPs uh, in country and external to your country, and with people like the KTN, the EEN, and and so, you know, it's really important that you understand what your UK entity wants from you. But what I'm going to do is, is just go through some of the core um, activities at the moment. So an NCP is uh, an essential component of Horizon 2020. And in my case, will provide you with the support and service to successfully apply for Horizon 2020 fund funding. The assistance offered um, expands right across the whole process, right from advising on which call you may want to embark on, uh, to building a consortium and through the lifetime of the project, if you seek that assistance. This presentation will give you a bit of a flavour of some of the assistance that is on offer to you as a UK entity, if you decide to be involved with the Horizons 2020 Secure Societies project. An NCP is an essential part of the, the, the process. And um, the entities that I'm there to support include researchers, research groups, universities, industry, SMEs, uh, end users, you name it. If, if they're a part of your project then, then from UK, then I can assist. Right, one of the core functions of an MP, uh, NP, NCP, is to inform, which means ensuring that general and specific documentation on Horizon 2020 is circulated to relevant parties. This includes conditions for participation and submissions of proposals, project budgeting and project reporting. It is also important that when appropriate, we organise promotional activities such as info days, seminars, and when necessary, webinars such as this. We are also tasked with raising awareness. So what should we raise awareness of? Well, these, this covers such things as innovation activity calls within Horizon 2020. These are types of calls that are designed to contribute to the growth of an organisation and increase jobs and overall to help boost the economy. These type of activities are directly aimed at producing plans and arrangements of designs for new altered improved products, processes and services. These types of calls, there is an enhanced need for industry and SMEs to participate. So if any of you are considering leading or being part of an innovation activity call, then please be aware of the specifications around the consortium building and the requirements of who you should be involved, involving within that project. We also are tasked with the awareness of raising the awareness of the interdisciplinary aspect of calls in relation to societal challenges. And this is uh, in, to include partners from multiple disciplines, such as industry, SMEs, um, public authorities, 
non-governmental organisations, public and private organisations in the security domain. The active involvement of end users is also of, of high importance within projects. So please ensure that you're aware of these participant specifications. Another aspect of, of awareness raising for an NCP is to underpin the Horizon 2020 strategy on gender equality and to foster gender balance in research teams and to close the gap in the participation of women. Some of the calls within the security, uh, in the, with it, under the secure societies do have that um, request in there, so, so please check that. The Commission believes that integrating the gender dimension within research and innovation helps to improve the scientific quality and societal relevance of the knowledge within a project and therefore improves the balance in any decision making. Um, we also are um, tasked with raising the awareness of the link between science and civil society. The, advance, the advances and the rapid advances in scientific research and innovation have led to the rise of important ethical, legal and social issues that affect the relationship between science and society. So for those that embark upon these types of programmes, these types of projects, please be mindful of the relationship between research and the public and how any potential negative impacts on society could be reduced. Assisted, as an NCP, another role of mine is to encourage new actors and SMEs to participate, and furthermore, to increase that participation. Due to the uncertainty around Brexit, participation of UK entities within the Secure Societies programme has decreased. Prior to the referendum in 2016, the UK was top ranked performer in respect of industry funding. Data is now showing that the UK is fourth in terms of industry funding, and overall we are now sixth. It would be really nice to um, increase that participation. We also assist and provide feedback on proposals in, part, in partner search activities, and we do that in cooperation with the KTN and the European Enterprise Network. And you've already heard from these organisations and how they can assist in this. We can also help and advise uh, you, UK entities, in respect of specialist legal and financial issues. Um, and our NCP for this is Stephen Alexander. Louise has already mentioned Stephen. He is our go-to person. Um, the one thing the one thing that I did when I first joined as an NCP was to speak to Stephen and he gave me some really, really good advice. He said, if you don't know the question, or the answer to a question, then don't give. Come to him. And um, so if you're asking any questions on financial issues or legal issues, I uh, will go and speak to him to make sure that what I'm telling you is, is, is correct. So please feel free to communicate with me as your first point of contact on that. Um, as an NCP working for Innovate UK, um, I can advise on administrative procedures, rules and issues, which include such things as roles and responsibilities, um, and some of the principles laid down in the EU Commission's Codes of Conduct. But again, uh, we, I will do that in collaboration with Stephen. Where appropriate, I as an NCP, working in conjunction with KTN, can organise workshops and training sessions these could be for specific groups such as SMEs or universities on topics such as proposal writing. And um, 
we have had a couple of um, training sessions on proposal writing in the past and if um, anybody would like to um, do one uh, on proposal writing within the security domain please let us know and all depending on the situation with the coronavirus this could be done by webinar so the cooperation the commission considers ncps to be important partners and to um, be their liaison person between them and any uh, um, entity who wanting to um, apply for funding ncps are always invited to attend um commission eu commission thematic conferences and seminars and we are continually updated on work programs upcoming calls changes in priorities and any statistics of course and, and evaluations however any new information or changes that come out of the eu commission they that will be made available on the on the portal so i do urge you to um make that portal basically one of your favorites on on your um, internet search and if you're looking to funding go to that portal on a regular basis but remember if you can't find anything you're looking for then please contact me here are my contact details don't hesitate to get in touch with me and um, if you need any assistance in your bids or applications i will get back to you as soon as possible thank you very thank much thank you for listening thanks so and i can and i can vouch for you as well Norm, every time i've emailed you i've always got a really quick response from you so that which is great i want to keep us um to the time schedule that we've laid out for you in the agenda so do keep the questions and answers coming in, but I'm going to go straight into Louise's presentation on hints and tips for applicants. Hi guys. So yes, me again, sorry about this. Um, so the proposal, we've talked about the, the call for proposals. Now we're going to have a, a bit of a discussion about the proposal itself. Um, and we talked about the anatomy of the topic. This is just to remind you because this is, these are basically the things that you need to be referring to and uh, focus on within your proposal. So the challenge, what is the problem? The scope, what are we asking you to look at? Budget gives an indication of the project size because they will normally say, you know, things like either between X and Y million euro or up to Z million euro. And that will tell you what sort of size project they want. That's not necessarily related to the size of the topic budget because there may well be three or four projects per topic, but that's really what the budget in the scope refers to. It's the size of the project. And then the expected impact, what it is we're trying to achieve and what type of action. That's the general scope of the outline. So we heard already that actually the most important thing to do before you start putting pen to paper and writing your proposal is to plan, plan and plan. So create a one page proposal is my advice, possibly two sides, but you know, you might do this in PowerPoint, you might do this as a Word document, but keep this as that top level overarching thinking, that what is it you're trying to do? And then you can use this to share with your partners and to facilitate a conversation with your NCP and to, when you're seeking partners. And so the sorts of headings in your one page plan is make sure you list which topic and that you're, you're involving in. Because if you're doing more than one topic, then keeping these separate is quite useful. The deadline, keep that up at the top because you need to, you know, you want to be quite clear of the deadline. You want to keep that in the foremost of your mind when you've got to have this submitted by. And I would absolutely support the previous comment about submit early remember that the deadline for submission is 5 p.m eu time i do get people phoning me up at quarter past four in the afternoon why won't it let me submit because it closed 4 p.m our time 5 p.m their time simple things like that can really destroy your you know six months potential work a working title of the project i know it sounds a bit strange but most 
projects have quite snappy acronyms and that really helps the evaluators because when they're talking about them to each other and, and thinking about it having a snappy acronym really helps so what are the objectives of the project and the background from your perspective and how do you want to achieve the objectives so some phases of the project perhaps so this is starting to think about what your work breakdown structure might look like and then you can start to think about what sort of expertise would be required to help you meet those objectives so basically you might not know the num the actual names of the consortium but you know what type of consortium partners you're looking for how long do you think the project will be and what's your rough estimation? Are you trying to do the entirety of the scope as specified? Or if the scope said you can do all or some of the following bullet points, are you going to just choose to do some of the bullets? And therefore it might impact your estimated budget. Now when, the, when it says the budget is between five and seven million, are you at the five million end or the seven million end? So having an outline plan is really useful for you to work with your partners. So when you come to apply your project as two parts, there's part A, which are all the administrative forms, and you can only do that online, but it also includes an abstract. The abstract is very important. It's not part of the evaluated process. You know, the evaluators don't read, don't score it, but they do read it. They will frequently read it first to set the scenes, to help them understand what it is they're going to come up with next when they read the detailed proposal. And then the part B of the, of the application is the proposal itself. This is the thing that is page capped. A design is given in the template, stick with it. I have seen proposals where they create their own structure and their own headings and subtitles, subheadings, and that's just a disaster. And because it's page capped, I have seen people try and get through with things like eight point font. That's just silly. It really is. Uh, 11 point is the minimum. If it's smaller than 11 point, it will not be evaluated, it will be classed as ineligible. So just some of the basics. So the technical proposal is actually where you're going to write your specific what it is you're going to do. This is the thing that is evaluated and it's quite straightforward. There are only three sections. There's excellence, which is what is your fantastic idea? There's impact, what difference are you going to make? And there's implementation which is the project plan. So we're not implementing necessarily the outputs of the project, that happens in impact, but implementation is how are you going to do the project? And then there are a couple of other chapters that are outside of the page cap, but very important as well. So members of the consortium is where you would put CVs, track record and history um, of the different members of the consortium if they've got um, patents that are relevant, if they've got huge amounts of expertise or innovation, track record, that's where that goes. And then there is, as we've heard earlier, an ethics and a security section, very important for this proposal, <clears throat> for this part of the work programme as well. So going through, right, it shouldn't have seized up now. Why is it seized up this time? Oh, that's probably gone too far now. Excellence. This is the subheadings within the excellence part of the template so the objectives you should usually have one main overarching goal your mission statement your vision and from that will lead off several subordinate to more specific goals what is it you plan to achieve not what is it you plan to do make sure it's that goal so when we talk about objectives it's end state then there's a section called relation to the work program and here it's quite common to see a table where you would have all of the topic text or the relevant topic text parsed out in one column and then in this each row equivalent to that facing it you'd have a section a description of how your proposal your proposal is actually addressing that topic text so when it says you know um, scope must cover this that and the other in your column you would say how you're doing so and then there's a section on concept and methodology and people again get mixed up with methodology and they start to talk about the work breakdown structure and it's not that so the concept is the idea behind the project it's sort of general so there's not too much of the how but there is things like the technology readiness level and how it connects with the rest of the world and then the methodology is the different types of activities and the excellence of the approach not the work package descriptions ambition is the final part of this excellence section and this is you know what is the state of the art and how are you going beyond it you need to demonstrate not only that you know what else is out there 
but how you are going to improve upon it. You have to also say what are the challenges. Uh, and now we're not talking about risks here, it's just the challenges to achieving that ambition. Is this around regulation? Is it around social norms? Uh, you know, those sorts of things. Oh, so it's not moving on again. Oh, there we go, impact. So we ought to, you know, by now understand that impact is about how your project contributes to delivering the expected impacts in the topic description. You should also include any additional beneficial impacts that weren't mentioned in the original topic. So, you know, you're not only are you achieving the impacts, but you're doing something else which is really useful and beneficial too. That would help. You should also describe any barriers or obstacles. Again, that's not the project risks though. And then there are some measures to maximize impact that people get a little bit again confused on because there's a section for dissemination and exploitation of results and there's a section on communication and people say isn't communication dissemination and vice versa not in this instance dissemination and exploitation of results are how you are going to ensure the project outputs are implemented so this could include things like a, a business plan um, it's a how have you got a credible path to deliver the innovations to the market? This could include the fact that you've actually got the operational end, the user community in your team. That would be a very useful thing to state here. So the communication activities are about state, you know, showing off, if you like, or breaking the news to everybody that you've got this wood, this project, you've won a, a European Commission piece of work, and you're going to put that in the newspapers and tweet it out and those sorts of things. So that's more about the, the PR, if you like, including the findings during the period of the grant, but it's the PR, uh, whereas the part A is about getting the outputs implemented. That word implementation on this section, though, section three of the breakdown, is the how are you going to do the project? So it's a work breakdown structure, it's your management structure, it's your milestones, organization chart, it's going to be a description of your consortium, including a skills matrix. So this is something that could be an expanded version from that that you did in the original one page plan who, which parts of your organization have the skills to deliver which part of the program. And then resources to be committed is quite often man months uh, per work, pro work package, um, and also any additional materials or equipment purchases. So that was quick so that we can get into the discussion on the evaluation, which is, I think, James is going to cover. Uh, one of the things perhaps I should have mentioned is that these three sections that are scored, the uh, excellence, impact and uh, implementation, a uh, maximum score is 15 and each of these is scored out of five and no points lower than half points are um, awarded. So um, it can be quite tough. But that's me then. Thank you very much, Louise, uh, for that for that presentation on your hints and tips. Now, I'm, I'm quite interested myself in this presentation, James. The evaluators aren't people you normally hear from. You just normally get some feedback and, and that's about as far as it goes. Isn't it? So I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say. OK, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely fine. Great. Right. OK, yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit now from, let's say, the other side of the fence, which is looking now from the evaluation side. So um, it's something I've been doing for quite a long time with the Commission and hopefully some of these things will be I'll be talking about will be will be helpful. Um, I, I apologise in advance to those who I'm, I'm sort of preaching to the converted, those who know many of these facts already. But for those who are especially new to European programmes and to um, research proposals, then I think hopefully some of this will be helpful. But I'll start by just saying a little bit first about how to become a, an expert evaluator. So, I mean, essentially any of us can be an expert evaluator. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say in a moment what, what the EU definition of that is. Um, but generally, if we have expertise in a particular area, which is obviously relevant in this case to security research, um, secure societies, then we can be an expert, um, whether it's in a specific techno technological area, or for example, as a practitioner, uh, or perhaps in ethics or law or something like this, another, another um, aspect. Um, then I'll talk about how to become involved in the uh, process itself. 
um, very briefly what the evaluation process is. I'm sure many are familiar with this. Um, and then really what I, what I see personally has been the benefits of being an expert evaluator. And then importantly, some common features of uh, successful and unsuccessful proposals. So of course, one big benefit of being an evaluator is you, get, you gain access to a lot of proposals and you gain access to a lot of evaluation reports. So you can really understand where the common mistakes are, let's say, and also the common aspects which contribute to a successful proposal and ones which ultimately get selected for funding. So what is meant first by an expert evaluator? I think it's almost common sense, but um, what the Commission says is that you have a chance of being selected as an expert if you have a high level of expertise in relevant fields of research and innovation. So and obviously in this case it's uh, appropriate to security. Um, you must be available for occasional or short-term assignments, uh, good knowledge of English, be able to use IT tools, which I think we're all getting better at almost day by day now, I think at the moment. Um, but these are important facts. Um, uh, so in particular, you'll see in a moment, uh, there's a requirement to do what we call remote evaluation, which means basically desk work in terms of reading evaluation, uh, reading um, proposals. And also there's on-site evaluation, which normally involves going, for example, to Brussels or even other places like Luxembourg for doing on-site um, meetings. So this is, this, is, this is it really. So expert assignments can be two things actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you, some of the others on this call also do this as well. Um, so you can evaluate proposals themselves, which are submitted in response to the calls, for example, that we've been talking about, the published topics, um, and also in terms of monitoring actions as well, in terms of monitoring ongoing projects. So being an expert uh, reviewer uh, for ongoing selected projects, ones which are actually under execution. I'll talk pr principally here though, about evaluating um, proposals that, that have been submitted. Um, and then experts offer a contract that defines the rights, obligations, the terms and conditions, uh, and also you're remunerated as well. Not very well, I would say, but um, particularly it covers expenses um, for the process. So you can become involved in the evaluation process um, through the participant portal. There's a link on the slide here for your reference. Um, it's a fairly straightforward process. You create a, a, a login if you don't already have one on the ECAS or the participant portal and you upload your, your biographic date, data, um, your CV, etc. And you can select keywords matching your expertise. Um, and, and basically the Commission will select experts according to a range of criteria. Um, expertise, of course, um, nationality balance, type, type of expert whether you're for example a practitioner or whether you're a scientist um, and there's a very strong emphasis uh, which is I'm, I'm glad to say on um, increasing the number of um, female uh, experts I think um, the, the target by the commission if I'm hopefully I'm correct in saying but I think at the target 40 percent if they can um, as far as possible and obviously in some disciplines that's harder than, so harder than some others but that's certainly the, um, the target they go for um, and experts are deemed to be independent and external uh, they abide by this code of conduct. Uh, you have to sign a declaration of uh, uh, no, uh, no conflict of interest. Um, and essentially that means that um, if, for example, you're involved in a proposal that's being submitted to the Secure Society's call, you won't be able to be an expert in terms of ev evaluating. Um, so that's something to bear in mind, but it doesn't um, uh, uh, negate you from being an expert evaluator, for, for example, for other calls. So sometimes, for example, there are other topics and other calls. For example, I'll give you a good example. Um, I'm a computer vision expert, um, but there might be a need for computer vision expertise in transport, because obviously transport can include aspects of surveillance or monitoring and things like this. So although I may not be submitting a proposal, I may be submitting a proposal to secure societies, but I may not be submitting one to transport. In that case, I could be an expert evaluator for transport. So you can evaluate for other topics, other calls, um, but if you're, if you're involved in that call yourself, um, then essentially you'll, you'll be deemed to have a conflict of interest. Um, you must maintain strict confidentiality throughout the process, so you can't uh, reveal what you've eva evaluated, of course, and of course you can't reveal uh, details of scores or evaluation reports. That's uh, simply um, in, you know, not possible. So you can go onto the portal. Um, I won't go through it now, but you saw earlier the portal details. Um, it's very simple to register as a new expert and then update your profile with your CV, etc. And then you'll be approached by the commission 
um, as and when available um, uh, to perhaps evaluate calls. And uh, this is something, by the way, that if you're at an information day um, for an area, um, do talk to the commission, do say to them you're willing to be an expert and you know they'll keep in mind. They often find it challenging, to be honest, um, to find experts to evaluate calls. Um, it can be a challenge sometimes because obviously if, you're, if there are many people in the community involved in proposals, um, they're, they're automatically not eligible. They're ineligible to be evalu evaluators, of course. So don't think you can't be an expert. Um, you, you know, do, do try it and uh, you, you'll see the benefits. Um, I won't go through this in too much detail, but um, obviously once you've submitted, once the proposal has been submitted, uh, it gets evaluated individually by an expert. Um, in secure societies, this would typically be three experts for one proposal. Um, sometimes it can be up to five for large initiatives, large uh, programs, but um, generally it would be three experts. They would evaluate the, well you in this case, would evaluate your um, the proposal individually according to um, the criteria defined by the Commission. So for example, we, we heard earlier about the different um, types of proposal, for example, ARIA, Research and Innovation Action. So there's different criteria defined for each of those um, sections in terms of excellence, in terms of impact, in terms of implementation. And of course, it's also good as a propo proposer to make sure you answer to those um, points under each of those sections. Um, but also as a, an evaluator, of course, you also refer to them. Um, so when you're reading uh, a proposal, you'll be making notes against those sub criteria for each um, each section um, once this remote process has been done then normally a consensus group uh, meeting will be held uh, physically uh, typically in brussels and then this is normally done over a course of a week so one thing i want to say um, and for those who haven't had experience of about being evaluated yourselves perhaps just involved in the proposal stage is it is a very fair process. I have to be quite honest with you. It's a very fair process, I believe. Um, every proposal that gets submitted gets a, a good amount of attention from individuals as well as from the consensus meetings. And then usually then there's a, a panel meeting uh, at towards the end of the week uh, um, where again, proposals can be cross-read or even cross-read before that, but they're cross-read and then discussed during a panel. So every proposal does get a very reasonable amount of time to be, um, to be properly evaluated. And finally, a final ranked list is generated and from that list um, is decided which proposals get selected for funding. Okay, and there's some criteria around that. Well, I won't go into the details of that now. If there's a question, please, please ask that on, on the session. So, as I say, you do a remote evaluation first um, at home or university, or you know, usually it takes a few days, um, and it very much depends on the type of proposal. Um, usually, every proposal gets evaluated for um, if it's a normal kind of RIA proposal, then it typically can be a day per proposal, um, eight hours or more, um, less perhaps for a CSA, but you know, it's a substantial, it's a substantial amount of time, effort behind it. Um, as I say, you, there's three to five separate or independent experts assigned to each proposal and their work is done independently. So you don't confer with other experts at this time. And we have to submit the reports uh, electronically, independently um, before the next stage. The next stage being the consensus meetings um, and each of those consensus meetings will last between one and three hours each for each proposal. Um, so there's a good amount of discussion um, you know, and sometimes it can be even longer. Um, and then you get to an expert or a rapporteur uh, is assigned to manage the process and who drafts the summary report, the evaluation summary reports. And you have a project officer in each of the meetings as well, uh, who's assigned to that topic, uh, who acts as the moderator. And then as I say, there's a panel meeting at the end of the week um, and uh, you have a panel chair as well um, and experts, of course, uh, you have the representatives of the Commission who take charge of that panel. And those panels are a uh, very uh, important part of the process because um, views uh, expressed by experts can be changed or challenged, um, scores can be changed even. You know, it's a very important part of the process. So the whole week is, in essence, is, is crucial to the overall evaluation process. 
So what, what makes a good expert? Um, well, according to RIA, uh, there are a few things which they've written down. So um, you must be timely in delivering your reports and uh, during the consensus meetings and the physical meetings. Um, it is a big uh, onus on time, but it's very rewarding. And I'll say that more about that in a moment. Why, why, why do I do it? I'll explain why. Um, uh, you have to be reliable, you've got to be reflexible, um, keep to um, quite uh, rigid time constraints. Um, you've got to be able to willing, willing to be uh, able and willing to accept the, and learn about the process. Uh, your written and spoken English must be of good quality. And of course, you must be able to judge and evaluate a project properly. Um, and in that sense, you've got to be able to express very clearly um, why, if there are negative points on the proposal, um, to express that clearly in relevant comments and appropriately also where a proposal is very positive on, on different points, um, you must be able to also express that clearly. Um, I'm sure for all of us who are involved in proposal writing or been involved in submitted proposals or even not, we'd all like the idea that when we get our evaluation summary report back from the Commission, it's quite detailed. And I have to say, my experience from security, secure societies as a unit, is that the reports you get back are very detailed. So it, it, it reflects the amount of time that's gone into discussing um, the comments and, and getting those written comments down on paper. Because um, it's important to understand where a proposal was stronger or weaker um, based on what's been submitted. So the benefits of being an evaluator. Well, firstly, a really big benefit is you learn a really big uh, aspect around the differential quality of proposals. When you have exposure to a large number of proposals, you really see differences in the structure and the content. And although, of course, the Commission provide a template for a proposal, which is downloadable from the portal, you still see a lot of differences in the way that proposals are constructed. You have still the same sections, but you can really alter the content quite a lot. And to give an example, sometimes people use more tables, sometimes less. Um, they, they write the section, the structure, the, the subsections in a different way. There's really, 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 honestly, there's really no real right or wrong, wrong way to do it, I would say. And there can be some wrong ways to do it, but there's no exact way to do it. Um, every proposal is different in, in its construction. And you'll see in a moment what's paramount is the right information is included and it's clear. Uh, this is important. So the other benefits is of, and I, I'll cover a few of those in a moment. Another big benefit, of course, is you understand common errors. Because you have exposure to lots of evaluation reports, you can really start to see trends in um, where there are positive points and where there's often um, errors made uh, or weaknesses in proposals, whether they're minor or more significant weaknesses. And you can see how that also reflects in the score. So you can understand some common errors which are made and try to avoid those. Of course, it helps in that, in that case with proposal writing. And sometimes there are sections which are not so easy to, let's say, judge how to write. I would say, for example, in H2020 proposals, you have to write, for example, a section on, on innovation management. Often people ask, what does that really mean? Um, well, if, you, if you're an expert, you can see what is considered to be a good writing of that section. You know, what, what scores more highly? Um, Risk management is another example, the expected impact. So what, 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 what is really a good risk analysis section? Um, you know, how, how is that constructed? In terms of expected impact, well, it was mentioned earlier, of course, you have to try and answer as best you can the expected impacts against the work programme, but what about other impacts? Um, you know, how should you structure that section? How long should it be? How detailed? You know, you really, earn, you really glean a lot from, from looking at proposals that have been submitted. And of course, another big benefit is you have professional exchange with other evaluators. Um, you meet your colleagues from other institutions um, who are there. You can't expose who they are. Of course, this is all very confidential. But of course, you can share knowledge and exchange details with other evaluators. And of course, that comes into play, particularly on a professional level, uh, during the consensus meetings and during panel meetings. Um, and of course, there's a big benefit is to connect with the European Commission and project officers. You get to know the project officers. Um, you get to know representatives in the commission and this, you know, this is helpful. Um, you know who to contact perhaps in the future if you have a query 
uh, regarding a particular um, call. And of course, you have pride and reward in helping to make funding decisions. You know, sometimes you're, um, you're making decisions which ultimately mean whether a proposal is funded at the level of three, four, five million euros, sometimes 10 uh, or even more. Um, so these, these, you know, this process is really critical and you have a big role to play in um, whether something is funded or not. So what are some common features of successful proposals? And as I say, some of these perhaps are obvious things, but sometimes the obvious can't be understated. Um, so firstly, we heard about whether a proposal is, whether it's eligible or not. And as I say, um, it's not uncommon to see um, up to 10% of proposals rejected because they don't meet the eligibility criteria. So, you know, this is the worst situation. You really don't want to have your proposal rejected. So it's very important to meet these eligibility criteria uh, to go through to the evaluation stage. Has it properly answered to the core topic? Well, again, it sounds obvious, but I, it's something I always tell to my university students when they answer their exam questions. I say, you read, read the question, think about it carefully, write your answer to the exam question on paper, and when you finish, go back and read the question again. And sometimes it's, you know, you think you've answered it correctly, but actually what you've written down is not really what's been asked. So go back and check that what you've written is really answering the question. And this is the same with proposals. Look at the core topic and try not to interpret it in the way that you think is um, the answer. Try to really understand really what they're getting at. And this is why, for example, um, these information days, particularly the ones organized by the commission, are helpful because during those events you can also ask official you can ask questions like, like we have on the chat here but they go to the commission and they answer them formally so you can you can you can try to get some additional information about topics or and sometimes and i don't know whether maybe i shouldn't say this but what happens occasionally is that when the proposal topics are being written they get written in a fuller form and then when they go through the program committees they get reduced in length and compacted and so on and probably unintentionally, sometimes it loses then some of the detail, uh, which may be been helpful in, in answering to it. So that becomes, that means that sometimes the topics become a bit more vague than maybe they should be, or they're left intentionally vague, so you can interpret it in the way you think. And I mentioned earlier, talking to practitioners then is very helpful as well, because you can really understand what do they really want. If you think, you've got to think about the user is really at the heart of all proposals, you know, if, if you're really going to come up with a, uh, a concept and an innovation, a set of innovation potentials, you know, uh, ideas that are going to solve a problem or, or help to solve something for the, for the end user, for the practitioner, if you can do that, then you, you're already 80% there. If you're really answering to their real needs, then this is going to be something that is you're on the, basically you're on the right track. So sometimes you have to try and fill in the blanks on the core topics but there are ways in which you can try and find out some more information through formal channels. And again, through the national contact point is, is one of those routes. Then of course, sometimes as an evaluator, I mean, sometimes these are obvious things, but have you, you know, have these things been clearly answered really what's been asked and why is the proposal relevant or, you know, um, so why is the proposal relevant, relevant, um, you know, to answer to the topic? What basically exactly is the idea solution that you're proposing? Um, who's going to do the work, is it credible, and how will it be done? And these are obvious things, but they've got to be clearly written up, clearly stated um, in the proposal. If they're not clearly stated, um, as, an, as, a, an, as an evaluator, you'd start to lose some credibility um, in, in, the, in the whole thing, basically. Um, and of course, you've got to have clear and measurable objectives. Um, you've got to demonstrate excellent understanding of the subject matter. So are you really, so what does, what does that mean? So that means you don't just put down your own ideas, but can you pull through um, the knowledge, for example, the practitioners and demonstrate that actually what's wanted is really what the practitioners want. So really demonstrate, you know, something that's real, something that's needed is actually being proposed. Is the concept sound, you know, um, and is it ambitious enough? Um, have you got a, a good understanding of the state of the art um, so and, and what what is beyond and what how you're going beyond and you'd be surprised how many proposals don't actually do a good job of that 
So you really got to demonstrate that you know your stuff. Um, again, for the impact, don't leave, leave it to the last minute to write your impact. Um, is it really, you know, are you, are you, have you really thought about what the potential impact of your proposal is? Management structure has to be there, has to be appropriate for the type of proposal. We talked about, we heard about earlier about dissemination and communication. The mechanisms there had to be well explained and also, um, I would say, I'm not quite sure innovative is the word, but sometimes, you know, being a, a little bit, you know, thinking a little bit through and making sure these dissemination and communication mechanisms are attuned to the, to the specific area you're, you're working on is, is beneficial. So rather than just having standard plans, is, is there evidence that you've actually thought through? A good example is dissemination. So when you, when you write a dissemination plan, one of the things, for example, an obvious thing is you're going to publish, perhaps, the academic partners maybe. But have you thought about where they're going to publish? What kind of outputs are they going to produce? Now, which journals, where? Give examples. It shows that you've thought and matched the, the outputs more tight, more closely to the topic of the proposal. And of course, you have to have a well-defined exploitation plan. In research and innovation actions, you don't need to have a detailed business case. But if you've got, certainly from my point of view, if you demonstrated that you have a, a, some understanding of the market, um, perhaps a very, very initial business plan, but very initial, um, this is beneficial. If it's an innovation action, You'll, you'll be expected to have a much more substantial market analysis and business plan in place. Um, but needless to say, part of exploitation is always going to be demonstrating that you do have a plan um, and you know where, where you're going. So this is important. And also make it easy to read. When, when you're first reading a proposal, you know, to be honest with you, I can pick up a proposal and I can tell you probably within about a minute something whether that proposal is good or not you know you get a feel for a proposal you can look across proposals but you have a good feel of proposal literally in, in the first first one or two minutes but when you start to read it those first 10 pages perhaps 20 pages at most really give you a very clear insight into whether this is going to be a good proposal or not so has it been proofread is it very clear have it have all the first parts of the proposal been well written is it very clear what's being proposed what the innovation potential is and so on. If you don't get, if you, if you start reading the proposal and you get to the first few pages and you still don't really understand what's being proposed or what problem's being solved, then you can see where it's going. So the first few pages in particular for proposal are very, very important. Not, notwithstanding the rest of the proposal has to be good as well, but ensuring the first few pages in particular have been proofread. So what I mean is, if you're getting near the end of the, um, getting closer to submission time, do get it proofread. And if someone can't proofread the whole proposal, ensure they at least proofread the first 10, 20 pages and make sure that part of the proposal was well written um, because it makes a difference. And, and further to that, making sure a proposal is consistent uh, as well. You'd be surprised how many proposals are evaluated where it doesn't take very long to start spotting inconsistencies. And normally, and not necessarily, but often it could well be the case that uh, the proposal has been rushed or many changes have been made just before submission and then things become inconsistent. So what, that, what does that mean? Sometimes things in tables don't add up uh, or something in, one, in the table doesn't correspond to something written somewhere else. It's very, very important to read through, leave enough time before submission to properly read through the whole proposal. And I would suggest at least a day, um, ideally more, but at least a day without making any changes to the proposal, to properly read through it and look for inconsistencies. Those things are important because evaluators, experts will spot them. Uh, maybe not everyone, but they will spot um, errors if there are enough of them. And of course, the more errors you spot um, tend to reduce your feeling of the credibility of the proposal. So here are some common features of unsuccessful proposals. And again, this is just from experience, from looking at um, ESRs and so on. So the obvious one is you don't actually answer properly to the core topic. Um, so, you know, it sounds obvious, but one way to address that, I think it was mentioned in the earlier presentation, is that many proposals have a, have a table where you document almost literally word for word what the um, uh, topic description asks for 
in the in the, in the call topic, and then you answer it in the table line by line, saying how this proposal is going to answer to this to those uh, to this topic. So you really make it very explicit and very precise how this proposal is answering to the call. The concept is often not sound. Um, you may think it's sound, but check the concept with others. Um, ensure the concept overall is really sound um, and is just, you know, it's not otherwise. Um, but you'd be surprised that many concepts that just don't feel right or are not backed up with sufficient evidence um, um, to be sound. A, bi a big common mistake is that objectives are not well defined or measurable. Um, objectives should be well defined and measurable. What does that mean? It means they should have KPIs, a means of actually measuring whether they've been successful or not. To put in an objective to say to improve something by X, Y, well to improve something or to produce something is not enough. It's got to be something that's measurable. Um, so in particular in secure societies they made a strong emphasis on uh, ensuring this is done. Um, so you're very likely to get a comment in your ESR, uh, your evaluation report, if you don't make your objectives measurable. Um, it's important. Proposals often lack innovation potential, of course, um, um, or enough innovation potential, or they lack sufficient advance in TRL. So we know, we heard earlier that research innovation actions tend to target, say, uh, TRL, TRL level around four to five. Innovation actions are higher, maybe up to say TRL seven. But document clearly what the TRL advance is. Again, it could be a little table that shows where the starting position is for a system or a set of technologies and how the TRL level is being advanced and, and to what level. The debt really make clear where the innovation potential is. Um, and that also links into the state of the art and beyond. So you really got to make clear uh, to the experts that you understand well the state of the art. If you're not comfortable with the state of the art writing it yourself, make sure one of the other members of the proposal consortium write it. So usually this is the section that's written by many members of the consortium because they have expertise in different areas, for example different technologies. Make sure they write the relevant subsections that demonstrating their knowledge of the state of the art and how the proposal will go beyond. Um, often the expected impact is not well described. So again, it's a bit like um, the objectives. The core description has a list of the expected impacts. Sometimes they're less, sometimes they're more, depending on the topic. But again, make sure they're all referenced in the proposal and go beyond. So many proposals, uh, ESRs, will make reference to impacts beyond the ones in the core topic. So don't think the ones in the core topic are necessarily all of them. You must address them, but think of other impacts as well, which could well be relevant and important to the proposal you're doing. Um, so do, do document them. A big one, of course, is lacking appropriate involvement of end users, practitioners. In secure societies, it's very important to demonstrate to the experts who's reading your proposal that you've adequately consulted them, and also the practitioners are, uh, the, their knowledge is demonstrated in the proposal, clearly. Um, and also they are involved in the proposal. So they're not just in the background being consulted, they have a role, uh, a role in relevant tasks, perhaps leading on, for example, demonstrations, for example, but they actually have a, an explicit and dedicated role in the work plan. Uh, so their involvement is, is crucial. Um, proposals often lack methodological detail. You'd be surprised how many work package descriptions I've seen um, where there's very limited text, uh, sometimes one line for a work package. So you see a task where there's 20 person months, but one or two lines of description of what the task will do. It's not sufficient. You know, there has to be enough attention paid to describing um, basically what will be done and how. Sometimes there's an inappropriate management structure. Um, so this can cover things like uh, or knowledge or IPR management, innovation management, is a, is, a, is a common one that's not in, is often insufficiently addressed. So make sure these things are properly covered in the proposal. Um, uh, it's a bit more tricky to talk about this one now in detail, but I'm, I'm happy to talk further beyond this if, if, if people are interested to know more. Um, but make sure the management structure has all the elements properly considered. 
and, and sometimes it happens that uh, it doesn't happen a lot but there can be a lack of relevant partner expertise in a required area so it does happen um, often these proposals are interdisciplinary but for example um, uh, I mean a good example is that uh, often secure societies proposals require legal expertise or ethical expertise and a good mandate for that would be to have a dedicated partner who covers ethics and legal aspects perhaps they're covering both from one partner um, i'm not saying it's necessarily the case but if you don't have a dedicated partner who covers those aspects you could it could be argued um, that there isn't sufficient attention paid to those aspects in the proposal just an example i'm not saying this is necessarily the case and it's very dependent on the proposal but make sure um, you've got the necessary expertise in all the areas that are required um, in, in an interdisciplinary proposal like this. Um, and that normally starts at the beginning of, of a course in the process when you start to decide the topic and which partners should contribute to it and the areas that need, they need to cover. And one thing that often, well, doesn't happen often, but I see very frequently is people don't convey all the required details in the, pa in, in the uh, page count. So a good a classic example, the references or bibliography for your proposal, your set of references, for example, must be within your 70 pages. So do not put that into another section of the proposal, keep it within the 70 pages. If you, if you put it outside the 70 pages, you will almost certainly receive a deduction in the score, probably under the, uh, under the excellence criterion. So something to consider. Okay, so that's that's probably a lot said actually. I hope I hope you hear you heard it all. But these are just a few personal insights into the evaluation process. And of course, every proposal is different, every call is different, every topic is different. Um, but this is uh, you know you can see as being an expert, it's beneficial. Because being a ben an expert also helps you to write proposals. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know you still got to have a good idea, write it up very well and then to write all the components of the proposal well, covering all the sub-criteria. You know, it's a big ask, um, but um, you know, any, anybody can do it. Um, uh, it just requires time and effort. Okay. Many thanks, James. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we are quickly running out of time um, for this session. So what I'll do is I'll just show you the few slides that I had. Um, hopefully you may have been aware of this, but may not have been aware that the, the brokerage event that was supposed to take place in March is now going to be online on the 7th of April. And there is an opportunity if you look down in the bottom right hand corner for you to actually complete a pitch presentation template and submit to this online event. Um, what we're suggesting is if you want to complete that pitch presentation template and send a copy to uh, myself or Viola at the Knowledge Transfer Network, we'll compile all of those and then share them with all of the participants of this webinar. So you have an overview of everybody that's been involved in the webinar if you'd like to do that. Um, we would also be happy, um, time willing, you know, please don't send it to us sort of a few hours before the final submission. Of your pitch presentation for this uh, this particular event but we are happy if we have time to review that um, pitch presentation um, that you've compiled and give you some feedback on that as well so just bear this in mind and there is an opportunity to pitch your your company or your organization and what you can offer to a consortium um, in terms of next steps where we are now, um, we will send you a link to everything that we've actually discussed today. So the webinar and the links that, that, that the presenters have actually said and to the Serene Four event that I just mentioned. So that will either come out to you today or at the very latest tomorrow. We will also send you a list of attendees and the organizations that they represent, but because of GDPR, we're not gonna send you the email addresses. However, if you did want to contact a particular person on that list of attendees, then please come back to us. And if they agree, we can make the uh, connection for you both. Um, remember, we're here to support you. You know, it's been said there's lots of support available. The NCPs, the KTN, EEN, Serene4, the EC Portal, we're all here to support you. So please reach out and talk to us. 
what we'd love to see is you updating us if you're involved in or you submit a proposal. Um, so it'd be nice to know whether or not you're actually, you've actually um, participated in a consortia or you've actually submitted a proposal yourself. And I would also check the KTN, the Knowledge Transfer Network website, our events page, um, and, sign, and or sign up for our newsletters. And that will tell you other further events that we're actually hosting or whether or not we're doing a, a, you know, a writing um, proposal workshops and so on and so forth. So check back um, with the KTN on a regular basis. Um, I think now we've got time, Viola, just a smidgen of time to take some of those last questions that we've been given. If we don't ask them all online, we will actually answer them offline and send them with the resources that we're going to send you over. So, Viola, do we have any? That's great, Hazel. Yes, we do have quite a few <coughs> left, but um, some of them you've answered already uh, in your last slide. So some of them were around helping to um, approach potential partners. And um, as Hazel said, we will send a list of all the attendees uh, for the webinar to you afterwards, excluding obviously email addresses, but do get in touch if you see a company you would like to get in touch with and we broker the introductions offline. Uh, Hazel also explained how you can uh, keep in touch and learn more about the brokerage events. Uh, you'll get a link to the same four event, which is possibly the most relevant coming up now for you. Our NKTN newsletters will be very relevant to you as well. Um, you heard about all the streamer and the EN partner search databases and the portal where you can find uh, partner search entries next to the relevant call topics. So use all of this material and all of those different sources to help you. Um, in terms, there were other questions now a bit more specific. One was around uh, translation uh, services and whether they would be eligible. Um, in particular, thinking about difficult languages, uh, Hebrew, Finnish, um, and I think it's about potentially help with translating high-tech documents or other type of these kind of more unusual uh, documents. I guess, as, and they'll correct me if I'm wrong, but if it's, if it's relevant and essential for the project, uh, I guess it would be a subcontract opportunity uh, you could use. Um, Viola, uh, it's Louise here. I would say if it's a part of the, the project, you have to be built into the cost, and that would be fine. It would not be part, there's no funding at all for proposal writing or support for proposal preparation. So if translation of documents are required to submit a proposal, then there is no funding for that. All proposals are submitted in English as well, just a final point. That's great. I think um, what uh, the, the the question was about, I think something to do with the project and translating something, the project outcomes. Um, that's my interpretation of this anyway. Um, so, Viola, I did, I did see that question and ask for clarification. Um, I'm still, if, if they're asking as a company or a small and medium enterprise, who are making translation tools can they become part of a tr project yes if it fits but like louis louis says if it's about translating a project proposal then no there isn't so yeah so i'm a bit confused about a little bit confused about what that question is okay so we please uh, the Dick, if you get in touch with us uh, separately, if you have any further questions around that, um, please, please do so. Um, another question, does an award of a local grant, for example, uh, via local MS partnerships here in the UK or national na other national funding, uh, does it affect a 2020, Horizon 2020 award? Um, no. It doesn't, it does, just uh, no. be careful of double funding, no, that is what you need to avoid. No? Yes, you can't have public funding to do the same project, um, you know, being paid twice to do the same work. But if you're in receipt of any government grants or multiple Horizon 2020 grants are doing different projects, that's perfectly okay. All right, so and I scroll down a little bit. We have maybe time for another couple. Um, question from an EEIG, European Economic Group, incorporating university and SME. Um, his question is regarding funding rates. So in an innovation action that supports 70% for SMEs and 100% for universities, um, 
will an EEIG get 70 or 100 percent? And if the EE, EIG applies as an entity, then it will have its own pick. And when it registered to get a pick, it will have registered as either a for profit or a not for profit. If the organization doesn't have a pick of its own, then the individual members of the organization will submit as separate entities. If that makes sense. So it's all about the pick. If you can get it, if the organization has a pick, then when it completed the participant portal registration to get a pick, then it will have you know, done so as either a for profit or a not for profit. That's great, Louis. Thank you. I think, Stefano, that answered your question. Um, and maybe finally, because it's an interesting question here um, and might be relevant to a few people, what progress is being made for the government to process applications for security clearance for SMEs or individuals? These security clearance certificates are critical to be accepted onto some of the more security sensitive projects. At present, individuals or SMEs without contract with government or industry, um, that is a sponsor, are unable to get this clearance. Can you comment on that? Uh, I, 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 I'm not privy to uh, security clearance processes and protocols. Um, it's not my area, especially government. Um, Sean, have you any input on that? Uh, I'm afraid I don't. It's um, the security clearance is a completely different part of the of the government. I'm not really sure I can help out there, but we can try and make some inquiries and find out. Yeah, shall we take that offline? Yeah, I think and I think I'm gonna have to stop you there, Viola, but we will if I ask all the panelists to stay behind after our um, delegates leave, then we can look at the rest of the questions and make sure we have answers um, to those before we actually send those out either today or tomorrow. Right. And yeah, and we can also put together an FAQ document which we can make available afterwards as well. Absolutely. I guess, I guess from my perspective, then I know there are, there are a few takeaway points that I have, and I'm sure each of you that have been party to this webinar today have some takeaway points. The UK are absolutely eligible to participate and Louise is going to circulate the EU official lines. Demonstrate you're a great partner to have in a consortia and engage with those end users early on. As James said, they are the heart of the proposals. There is a wealth of support for you out there and available for your NCPs, KTN, EEN, Serene4, EC portal, you know, just reach out when, as and when you need us. And then, you know, quite rightly, as James said, be aware of common mistakes in the unsuccessful proposals. Um, I've got a nice little arrow down there for our uh, Twitter feed at KTN UK. We would welcome your feedback through that or to us um, regarding how you felt this actual webinar went for you today. And it's at this point I normally say to everybody, thank you for joining us and, and wishing you a safe journey home. Um, but I suspect most of us are actually in our homes at the moment. So um, today I'd like to say thank you um, to our two NCPs, Zayl and Louise, uh, to our panel members, Sean, Neil and James, and to Tyler and Charles for their annotated presentations, and both Viola and Poonam, who have worked very hard to make this happen for you as an alternative to our face-to-face. -face. So stay safe, look after yourselves, your loved ones and each other through these difficult times. And we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you very much for joining us.